Welcome to the People's Maps Commission virtual public hearing for the 4th Congressional District. The hearing will now begin. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This evening's hearing will include testimony from three subject matter experts who will talk with us about the Voting Rights Act as well as the impacts of redistricting on underrepresented populations. Our speakers tonight are Rebecca Lopez, who is a senior associate in Godfrey, Khan, Godfrey and Khan's Labor, Employment and Immigration Group. James Hall Jr., who has practiced law in Milwaukee since 1979 and has extensive experience representing individuals in matters involving discrimination in employment, housing, and education, and Tahasi Hill, who is chairman of the Oneida Nation. Following the presentation, commission members will have an opportunity to have a short period of Q&A with the presenters. Finally, beginning at approximately 6.50 p.m., the public testimony portion of the meeting will begin. As a reminder, due to the unfortunate increasing spread of COVID-19, this remains a virtual hearing with many participants from around the state and the nation, and technology can be fickle even under the best of circumstances. We appreciate in advance the patience and understanding of viewers, as well as the presenters and commission members, should there be any technical challenges this evening. With that, I will now hand it over to Commission Chair Christopher Ford to call the hearing to order. Thank you and good evening. I would now like to call the fourth hearing of the People's Maps Commission to order. Uh, as a reminder tonight, we do not need a quorum because we're not voting on any matters. Uh, this is an informational hearing only. Uh, when I say your name, uh, if you could, please say present. Uh, Commissioner Tobias from the 1st Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Anthony from the 2nd Congressional. Present. Uh, Commissioner McClellan from the 3rd Congressional District. Present. Uh, Commissioner Rangel from the 4th Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Ramp from the 5th Congressional District. Present. Uh, Commissioner Prentice from the 6th Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Phillips from the 8th Congressional District. Present. Thank you. Oh. Yep. Oh, sorry, Jason, we missed you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Bissonnet uh, from the uh, 7th Congressional District. Last but not least. Jason's present. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, before we begin tonight's hearing, uh, I want to make sure the citizens of the 4th Congressional District, uh, my home district, uh, where we are having our virtual hearing today, uh, are able to briefly get to know our commissioners a little bit more. Uh, now I invite each of the commissioners to say a few introductory remarks uh, about themselves. So um, starting with the 1st Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Tobias. Yes, hi. Thank you, Chair Ford, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Tobias, and I am from the 1st Congressional District. I live in Racine, Wisconsin, um, and I work for the Racine Unified School District. I'm super excited about this evening's theme tonight and what we're going to be focusing on, so I'm looking forward to learning so much more about these important topics. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tobias. Uh, from the 2nd Congressional, uh, Commissioner Anthony. Good evening, I'm Ruben Anthony. I'm, I'm the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison, and I'm pleased to be a part of this mapping commission, and I'm excited to hear um, what the speakers have to say tonight, especially I'm excited to hear what my friend, um, Attorney James Hall has to say. I haven't seen him in a good while, but really it should be an exciting meeting tonight. Absolutely, thank you, uh, Commissioner Anthony. Uh, from the 3rd Congressional District, Commissioner McClellan. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Anne Marie McClellan. I live in Menominee, Wisconsin in the third CD. I am retired after a career in both manufacturing and clinical research, being employed both as an industrial statistician and as project manager. Um, voting rights has always been a big passion. And so I'm so pleased to be on this commission to really understand um, more about redistricting and listen to these experts. And I look forward to listening to the experts tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and sharing the 4th Congressional District with myself, uh, Commissioner Rango, who we'll hear a little bit more from today. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Ford. I just want to say hello. My name is Benjamin Rango. Uh, as Chair Ford alluded to, you'll hear from me more in a bit, but uh, I live in Bayview here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, grew up in Racine, went to school in Madison, so spent most of my life really all around Wisconsin. Um, and I currently probably serve as a 12th grade high school government teacher uh, at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School here in Milwaukee. So thank you. Looking forward to the hearing. Thank you, Commissioner Rangel. Uh, from the 5th Congressional District, Congress, uh, Commissioner Ram. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Susan Ranft. I live in Wauwatosa and I represent the 5th District. I am an HR leader at Manpower Group. Um, look forward to learning from everyone this evening. Thank you, Commissioner Ramp. Uh, from the 6th Congressional, uh, Commissioner Prentice. Thank you, Chair Ford, and good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Prentice, Commissioner for the 6th Congressional District. I am a librarian and currently the Public Services Manager at Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, where I also live. And I'm happy to be here this evening uh, representing the 6th District and looking forward to the hearing. Thank you, Commissioner Prentice. Uh, Commissioner Bissonnette from the 7th, I feel like I should give you extra now, Jason. <laughs> well, that, that's all right. Um, uh, my name is Jason Bissonnette, uh, representing the 7th Congressional District. Um, I'm a, the Dean of Students for the Lukudere Ojibwe uh, K-12 School, and I also sit on the, uh, the Board of Regents uh, for the uh, Lukudere Ojibwe um, College. Um, it's absolutely an honor to be a part of this. Uh, again, um, this is an incredible part of our democracy, and it's exciting to be a part of. So thank you. I look forward to this evening. Thank you, Commissioner Bissonnette. Uh, from the 8th Congressional District, Commissioner Phillips. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the expert presenters tonight and to all of those citizens who are giving us statements. Uh, I live in Appleton. I'm a retired oncologist, cancer doctor. Uh, and I want to say hello also to all the grassroots organizations that are showing tonight and watching Fair Maps represent us and all of your other wonderful grassroots people. So thank all of you. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips. Um, and I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Chair Ford. I represent the 4th Congressional District as well. I'm an emergency medicine physician uh, in Milwaukee, and I live in Whitefish Bay. And uh, just like everyone else on the commission, we're really excited to be here in the 4th District, although virtually, which we're in person, but you know, all things considered, and look forward to hearing from uh, our experts today. Uh, so I hope everyone gets a feel uh, in the 4th Congressional District that those, you know, apologies if you hear screaming in the background, there's kids out there. Um, uh, you can see each one of us commissioners are truly normal and average people uh, from the state of Wisconsin. All of us come from diverse backgrounds and we hold different kinds of jobs and even have very political beliefs. Uh, but we have one thing in common, uh, the desire to have fair legislative maps and to work together with citizens uh, throughout the state to make those fair maps happen. Um, before uh, uh, Commissioner Rangel kind of gives us a little bit of a background on the 4th Congressional District, I uh, wanted to take this time to share uh, some news here that we had um, in the last couple of weeks uh, with the commission, as well as um, uh, with one of our partners that we'll be moving ahead with. And so um, uh, the People's Maps Commission is pleased to announce uh, that we will be working with the MGGG Redistricting Lab uh, as the data uh, analysis partner for our work in 2021 uh, later this year. The lab is based uh, at the Jonathan M. Tisch School of Civic Life uh, at Tufts University. They maintain the staff of mathematicians, data scientists, geographers, and outreach specialists dedicated to nonpartisan work, uh, supporting the best practices in redistricting. MGGG is led by Moon Duchin, a mathematician who spoke to us earlier, um, at Tufts who specializes in the geometry and re of redistricting and has led a range of projects in the data science and for civil rights. And so we're very excited to be working with them and uh, you'll be hearing more from us as we uh, proceed throughout this process. So um, without further ado, uh, uh, Commissioner Rangal, feel free, uh, go right ahead. Thank you, Chair Ford. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge in Milwaukee and uh, the fourth congressional district that we are on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of, of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnik rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin's uh, sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. And I want to thank my fellow commission members for joining me virtually this evening in Wisconsin's 4th Congressional District. For those who are not familiar with my district, according to the last census, my district has a total population, and I should say our district, Chair Ford and I, uh, our district has a total population of over uh, 710,000 individuals. It presently covers all of the city of Milwaukee, as well as, as, well as the suburbs of Cudahy, St. Francis, and South Milwaukee. It also has a number of Milwaukee County 
North Shore communities, including Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, and Brown Deer. It's an extremely diverse district with 41% of residents identifying as white, 33% black, 18% Hispanic, 4% Asian, and 3% identifying as other. And let me just say on a personal note, uh, I am humbled and honored to represent the people of the fourth district on this commission. I've not lived in the city as long as many of you might have, uh, moving here just after I graduated college. But in that short time, I have grown to love Milwaukee and the surrounding area. I love the beautiful park system and its proximity to water. Biking along the Oak Leaf Trail or kayaking down the Milwaukee River are things I look forward to doing, doing each summer. I love its working class history from its self-imposed designation as the machine shop of the world in the early 1900s to the sacrifice that working people have made for labor rights in our city. I love the resiliency of our people, especially those who have fought and continue to fight for racial and economic justice, including activists like Angela Lang with Block and Christine Newman Ortiz with Voces de la Frontera. Both organizations embody the state motto of Wisconsin. That motto is forward. They move our city and state forward into a more just and equitable place to live. I love that Milwaukee, in the words of beloved local historian John Goethe, is a city of neighborhoods, all with their own identities and treasures to offer. And these neighborhoods and the people that call them home are what make our city so incredibly beautiful and important. I love so much about the city and the fourth congressional district and its people that again, serving the fourth district on this commission is the responsibility and honor of my lifetime. However, what I don't love is when the people of our community feel unheard. I don't love our elected officials getting to choose their voters instead of voters getting to choose their elected officials. The crisis of gerrymandering has impacted the people of the fourth district in a variety of ways. In our past hearings, we have heard from experts detailing the partisan advantage in the surrounding state legislative districts. Residents have spoken passionately about how they feel like they are. They have no way to hold their representatives especially at the state level accountable. No doubt, today we'll hear, we will hear similar testimony. In addition, the city itself is often pitted against legislators in Madison um, and uh, we depend on the state for funding and the state depends on Milwaukee. Uh, this should not be an adversarial relationship, but a symbiotic one. Fairer maps would lead to a more inclusive legislature that views our city and our district as the resource we all know it is. Especially in light of recent national events, the need for a more robust, responsive democracy is what we need more now than ever before. Fair nonpartisan maps, the maps I know this commission with the help of experts and the people of Wisconsin will create is an essential part of our state's future. Milwaukee, residents of the fourth district, I may not have called Milwaukee home for long, but if I'm lucky going forward, I'll call it home for life. I know the residents of the fourth congressional district are passionate about fair maps. And I look forward to hearing from some of our constituents this evening in the public testimony portion. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this overview. Chair Ford. Thank you, Commissioner Rangel. That was, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all the commissioners as well. Uh, thanks to the fourth district for having us here today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the commission and what we've learned over the last uh, few hearings. So uh, over the last couple of hearings, uh, we've been hearing about developing legislative districts and how redistricting process is a complicated science. Uh, it can impact individuals in very um, uh, differing ways. Um, tonight, uh, we're pleased to have three individuals who uh, have extensive knowledge on the Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, it originated in 1965 uh, and is a large part of what we want to adhere to uh, in order to um, continue uh, our, our goal of creating a fair and just map. Um, each one of our um, uh, individuals uh, that we'll be speaking with tonight, each one of our um, uh, experts have experience working with underserved populations, uh, communities of interest as well. Um, and as a group, um, in the last couple months, we have developed in our own right uh, different committees in which we're going to adhere to each individual principles of our MAPS process that we wish to um, uh, have uh, evolve into our end product. 
Um, each one of our individuals that we'll be speaking with tonight, each one of our experts has seen firsthand the significant impacts uh, and what they can have on some of the lives of some of the most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, before we begin, uh, I will ask that the commissioners please save their questions uh, until both uh, this evening's presenters are presented. Um, and it looks like uh, our one of our presenters is already here, so we'll go ahead and introduce her. Um, our first presenter is uh, Rebecca Lopez. Uh, she's a senior associate at Godfrey and Cons Labor, Employment and Immigration Practice Group. Uh, prior to beginning her legal practice, uh, Rebecca worked for the United States Senator uh, as a district office manager. Uh, Latino Outreach and uh, Regional Coordinator uh, and Constituent Services Liaison. Uh, she is a Milwaukee native, uh, remains actively involved in supporting Milwaukee nonprofit organizations and in small businesses as well. Uh, Rebecca, uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to uh, participate in tonight's hearing. Uh, I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you to all of you on the commission and everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I truly believe this is one of the most important projects uh, that is going on for, for our state and for our communities. And I know it's a huge investment of time. So thank you for your dedication and your service. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna jump right in. Um, I was asked tonight to, to share about my experience working with the Latino community as well as some information about redistricting. Um, and I know our time is tight, so I'll try to move through it quickly, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself and where my experience comes from. My father immigrated to Milwaukee from Mexico in the 1970s. And when he immigrated here, he helped to build the railroads that our trains were running on and work in construction. And he also worked to help build the Alaskan pipeline. He came here with his siblings, and I currently have 54 first cousins and 82 second cousins, many of which are here in Wisconsin, contributing in many ways. This is not a unique story. Many Latinos throughout Wisconsin have come here looking for work and for better opportunity and better education and brought their families and, and made a life here. And so when we travel around the country, many people are surprised to know how large the Latino community is in Wisconsin. Uh, but I can tell you that it is growing and it will be here today. Uh, a vital contributor to everything uh, that is moving in this state and the city of Milwaukee forward. Rebecca? Yeah. Rebecca, hi. You're sound, you sound a little far away. Is there a way that we could, you could get a little closer to the mic? I will, is this working if I move this close or should I call in? Um, I, we can make this work, I think. Okay. If you'd like to, sorry, that, that, might, um, that might also work. Give me a second here. Okay. What you're saying is so important. I just want to make sure people can hear it. Thank you. Yes, calling in might be best, is what our, our technical folks are saying. Okay, so it sounds like all I need is for the host to have me join. So if someone can have me join, then I can join by phone. Thank you all for being patient. We have folks working on this right now. And thank you for being patient, Rebecca. Great. Sounds like you got me in. Thank you. Okay. Is there an echo for anyone else? Do you want me to have your YouTube on in the background, maybe? Sometimes that will happen if your YouTube for the stream is happening in the background. And maybe mute your computer where you've logged into the computer. Mute that microphone so that we're not getting. I think I think that did it. <laughs> yeah, we've made it. Okay. Thank you so right. much. Sounds good. So. Um, the first thing I want to start with is a, a quick discussion about what the term Hispanic or Latino means. It's an important discussion point for us here today. So the term Hispanic was actually introduced in the 1980 census. 
Um, it's important to note that, um, that before 1980, those who came from Mexico, Latin America, South America were considered Spanish speaking and having Spanish origin or were considered white on the census. This frustrated Mexican American activists because oftentimes they didn't have data to prove that their communities were in need of representation through political mechanisms. As a result, the National Council of La Raza, which is known today as Unidos US, lobbied the Census Bureau to change the way it categorized Latinos to unite Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, Central Americans and South Americans together under this idea of Hispanic. Many people felt that Hispanic didn't accurately reflect the beautiful tapestry of history and ancestry of the people of the Americas to the South. And so the term Latino came into use as a representation of a more broad recognition of the fact that Latinos or Hispanics can be white, they can be black, um, and our backgrounds have influences from, from all over the world. Importantly, this term includes individuals with ancestral ties to 29 different countries with different histories and cultures and experiences in the political realm. Therefore, um, oftentimes you'll hear people say that the Latino community is not a monolith. And I think that's an important point to make because uh, backgrounds and histories influence the way Latinos vote and what their, their issues politically are. When I worked for Senator Feingold in developing a statewide Latino outreach program, I noted that even here within Wisconsin, the issues that were affecting Latinos in northern Wisconsin and rural areas sometimes deviated from those in the more urban areas and oftentimes was driven by the political history and the history of those immigrants and the countries from which they came. Um, by, by numbers, I think it's important to know that largely the growth in the state of Wisconsin is as a result of the Latino community and that the Latino community is present throughout the state of Wisconsin, not just in Milwaukee, but certainly in the city of Milwaukee is where Latinos have the greatest presence, where they make up almost 20% of the city of Milwaukee's population. Milwaukee County, more broadly, Latinos represent 15.6% of the population. And as you can see, there are communities like Racine, Kenosha, and Brown County, where Latinos make up a large portion of the population. According to the Pew Research Center, Wisconsin's Latino population is the 25th largest in the United States. Latinos largely demographically are young. Um, many Latinos are under the age of 18 or just approaching the age of 18. Um, this is an important statistic to keep in mind as I think more and more Latinos will become voter eligible in the years to come. And so the maps that you will be drawing, um, it, it will be important for them uh, to take into consideration that you will have more voting age Latinos in the years that move forward. Um, it's a growing population that contributes to our economy. As you can see in this slide, um, Latinos are very entrepreneurial. They also work in, um, in many industries that continue to operate even during COVID, and many of these employees are considered essential workers. According to the Hispanic Collaborative, 80% of Milwaukee's Latino workforce works largely in four industries, food, buildings and grounds, farming, fishing, and forestry, and production. And I thought it would be important for you to note that 80% of the milk that's harvested in Wisconsin is actually harvested by immigrants, many of whom are Latino. Um, many communities where um, businesses have attracted workers um, have seen a huge spike. So for example, in Arcadia, Wisconsin, 72% of children enrolled in the Arcadia School District in September 2019 were Hispanic, and that's in Trempeleau County. Because we're talking about Milwaukee and, and the 4th um, Congressional District here today, I just wanted to note, too, that Latinos have been here for a long time. The first recorded history of a Latino being in Wisconsin is in the 1880s when Rafael Valles settled in Milwaukee and became a music teacher at Marquette College. Marquette College later went on to be known as Marquette University. Many Mexican Americans uh, began coming and settling in Milwaukee uh, to work at, on the tanneries and railroads and foundries. And similarly, Puerto Ricanos came from the island and from across the United States to contribute to the labor force in the 1940s. It was in the 1960s and the 1980s where we saw an increase in immigration from Cuba, South and Central America and Milwaukee. While the two um, 
the two groups that are the largest in, in the Latino community come from Mexico and Puerto Rico. We have a rich tapestry of individuals who are here from um, Costa Rica, from Central America, um, and, and from uh, various Caribbean countries. In Milwaukee County and Milwaukee um, more broadly, you can see that 37.1% um, of the Latinos in Milwaukee County are actually under the age of 18. Uh, the average household size is larger for Milwaukee County Latinos, um, but as you can see, there are still disparities and challenges that are experienced by the Latino community. The average household income as compared to the mean in Milwaukee County is significantly lower. We find that Latinos oftentimes are not paid as well or the higher wages and also um, suffer from some of the same challenges from a high school graduation rate. There are many Latino elected officials and leaders throughout our community who have worked to advocate to ensure that throughout this long history of Latinos in Milwaukee, that we have access to better education, to labor representation, to bilingual education. Um, but as you can see, oftentimes that still falls short and we don't always have the representation that we're looking for. Latinos are also voting and they're increasing in their participation in the electoral process. Um, according to the Pew Research Center, uh, Latinos make up 4.2% of Wisconsin's voting population, and the Latino electorate is the fastest growing demographic in Wisconsin. Now, there's been strong statewide support from Latinos and non-Latinos alike for certain initiatives that benefit the Latino community, things like driver's licenses for those who are unable to get driver's licenses currently, in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants who are attempting to enter our university system, improved education and education opportunities, and certain support for small businesses. Notwithstanding the support, including support from the dairy industry throughout the state of Wisconsin, these initiatives largely have not gained traction in the legislature. One of uh, the, there was an article um, published by the New Yorker that reported that um, because the maps in Wisconsin currently are so gerrymandered, it is um, minority neighborhoods who have been particularly disenfranchised from representation and from being able to push forward ballot initiatives because there is a lack of accountability. So that's just some background. Um, I'm always happy to talk uh, more about the slides that we covered and provide more detail if you would like to discuss it. Uh, but I wanna move into some of the legal principles and a lawsuit that actually was brought to the federal courts in 2012 by Voces de la Frontera, an organization that has long been a champion of the Latino community in Wisconsin. Um, as we know, the U.S. Constitution requires that the federal government conduct an actual enumeration of the U.S. population every 10 years to ensure that there is a, a basis for representation in the House of Representatives and it's adjusted to reflect the population every 10 years. Uh, separate and apart, the Wisconsin Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, requires the Wisconsin State Legislature to update its Senate and Assembly districts following each federal census. Now, Although the right to vote was extended after slavery to black Americans, we know that in the history of our country, um, the states and local municipalities found different ways to disenfranchise black voters by creating poll taxes and tests at voting sites to restrict their ability to vote. And as a result of that, in response to that, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed to overcome the le legal barriers to voting at the state and local level. Um, indirectly, um, a lot of these same tools for blocking people from voting were implemented against the Latino community throughout the United States. And in 1975, the Voting Rights Act was amended to also end discrimination against language minorities who continued to be kept from voting. In part, this required the translation of materials to facilitate voting by language minorities and allowed Latinos to file court challenges against discriminatory redistricting and election systems. Section two of the VRA prohibits voting practices or procedures that discriminate on the basis of race, color, or membership in one of the language minority groups as a result of that amendment. In 2012, Voces de la Frontera argued that the maps that were drawn by the state legislature uh, for the first time since 1951, the, the maps at that time were drawn by one party and one party alone. It was not a bi, uh, bipartisan effort. 
And, and what Voces de la Frontera argued was that the way that they had drawn the map actually diluted citizen voting age population Latinos across two assembly districts on the near south side of Milwaukee. What the, the court noted was that neither party disputed that Milwaukee's Latino community actually had borne the socioeconomic effects of historic discrimination in employment, education, health, and other areas, and that the depressed socioeconomic status hindered its ability to participate in the electoral process. The dispute was whether two minority influence districts are superior to one majority minority district. So to break that down a little bit differently, when those maps were drawn on the 8th and 9th assembly district, what they did is they broke up the Latino vote to try and give Latinos influence in both of those districts. Um, but it did not give the Latinos a majority in either one. And so the debate actually centered around um, whether it was preferable to have one um, district where Latinos were more assured to have a representative that they could elect. Um, or if it was preferential to have two districts where they would just have an influence, but it was not a sure thing that they would have the ability to, with, with the numbers, to elect their chosen representative and, and the candidate of choice. And, and what the, the court pointed out is that representative democracy is not just a matter of making sure you have the same number of people in each district. What you want to look at are factors like homogeneity of needs and interests, compactness, contiguity, and avoidance of breaking up counties, towns, villages, wards, and neighborhoods that are all necessary to achieve this end. What's interesting about the debate is that the court pointed out that it's not enough to say that the way that you drew the maps would result in ensuring that one party or another would be elected. Both political parties in the United States are big tents which means that within the Democratic and the Republican parties, you have individuals of varying ideologies and varying priorities. And what the court pointed out is that for minority communities, like the Latino community in this case, it was important that the qualifying minority have the opportunity to elect representatives who will have strong voices on the topics that matter to them. So, as a result of the fact that in this district, most individuals vote Democratic, in the past, prior to this lawsuit, it, there, it, there were very few instances in which Latinos actually represented the district that was largely Latino. Part of this was because Latinos did not participate in the vote as often, um, but part of it was just that the white community in this area showed up to vote and so was more likely to elect a white representative. Um, it's not to say a white representative wouldn't reflect the views of the minority community, but they might not. And so the court said that it was important for there to be a, a, a candidate that's favored uh, by the Latino community that reflects their views. Uh, just being of a party that they might have voted for was not enough. Um, so to state that in, in a little bit of a different way, Latinos' political views are, are varied within even the Latino community, but it is important for them to have the opportunity to elect someone that they truly believe represents their views. And part of the issue in this case was that the way that the maps were drawn did not reflect Latinos who were one, voting age and able to actually elect someone, and two, um, because of, of the historic challenges that the community faced, was unlikely to reach a percentage that would give them the majority. And so what the court ultimately held was that it was important under the Voting Rights Act for there to be one majority district where the Latino community would be able to elect someone and then a district of influence. Um, this is an issue that I think is worth some additional discussion that we won't get into right now, but happy to answer questions about it as we move on. There's some additional resources here for you and the committee, and then I am going to go ahead and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you all for your time and consideration. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate uh, taking the time here. Um, our second presenter is James Hall, Jr. Uh, he's practiced law in Milwaukee, uh, as stated before, since 1979. Uh, and his extensive experience representing individuals uh, in matters involving discrimination uh, in employment and in housing and in education. 
Uh, he is also the past president of the NAACP in Milwaukee uh, and is founding member of the 100 Black Men of Milwaukee. Uh, additionally, he has served in numerous leadership positions uh, in the National ACLU. James, uh, thank you for joining us this evening and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, good evening. As stated, my name is James Hall, and I'm an attorney. I've been in practice um, in Milwaukee and the state for over 40 years. Uh, and as was also stated, I was on the board of the ACLU of Wisconsin and the National Board for many years, past president of NAACP. I'm also on the board. I'm a board member of FCAB, that's Felmer's Cheney Advisory Board, at the present time. I mentioned those organizations um, by way of background, just to let you know who I am. But I'd like to state for the record that my comments here, my testimony and any comments I may make are my own and I'm uh, not intended uh, to speak for any of these groups or organizations or anyone else. I was involved in 2015 with the group that developed the Fair Elections Project and launched the Gill versus Whitford case and took it to the Supreme Court. A group of us met for many uh, months at George Watts Tea House in Milwaukee, uh, that's now extinct. But we met there for many months developing that case and um, strategizing to bring it forward because of our concern about partisan gerrymandering. Through gerrymandering, lawmakers use their powers to draw maps that virtually guarantee that they will win the majority of elections, even when they do not win uh, the majority of voters. As Justice Elena Kagan has stated, partisan gerrymandering, gerrymandering quote, has turned upside down the core American idea that governmental power derives from the people. When 53% of citizens vote for one party, but that party gets 39% of the legislative seats, something is wrong. Past redistricting practices and tactics have resulted in unequal voting power un among Wisconsin citizens, providing unfair representation for communities of color, and fragmentation of communities of interest. While no plan is insulated entirely from partisan bias, elected officials and the courts have an obligation to ensure that the public good is not sacrificed to the self-interest of political parties. Such practices alienate voters and weaken democracy. The Wisconsin State Legislature has been dominated by Republicans for a decade, not because they always win the vote, but due to gerrymandering. Our point in the Whitford case, and the point now, is that locking up the political process for the purpose of disabling competition among partisan viewpoints is at odds with the proper role of government in administering elections. It's inconsistent with democratic values and constitutional precedent, holding that government, government must function as a neutral referee in administering elections. The constitutional obligation of governmental neutrality stems from the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. In a series of cases in the 1960s, one of which coined the phrase, one person, one vote, the United States Supreme Court held that the 14th Amendment guaranteed equality of voting power and that electoral systems in states that failed to allocate voting power on the basis of population were unconstitutional. For state and local offices, one person, one vote requires jurisdictions to make an honest and, and good faith effort to construct districts as near to equal population as practicable. Uh, in the case Davis versus Vandermeer, uh, Supreme 1986 Supreme Court case, 
the Supreme Court held for the first time that a plan which discriminated against a political party could be challenged under the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment. Although the court rejected the plaintiff's claim in that case, it indicated that a violation could be established by proof of intentional discrimination, an actual discrimination, discriminating effect, and that the system would consistently degrade the group's influence on the political process as a whole. Now, as a practical matter, the Supreme Court has not invalidated redistricting plans on the basis that they violate, that, that they involve partisan gerrymandering. The standard of proof has proved to be illusory, if not impossible to meet. While the US Supreme Court has affirmed in the case of Miller versus Johnson in 1995, that racial, racial, racial gerrymandering is a violation of constitutional rights and has upheld decisions against redistricting that are purposely devised based on race. As I stated, the court has struggled as to when partisan gerrymandering occurs. And an example of that would be the court's decision in Veep versus Jubilee, uh, 2004, and in Gill versus Whitford, our case uh, in 2018. In a landmark decision, Rucho versus Common Cause, 2019 case, the Supreme Court held that judging partisan gerrymandering is outside the realm of the federal court system due to political questions involved. In, in, in other words, the court determined it to be non-justiciable. The majority opinion in Rucho stated that extreme partisan gerrymandering is still unconstitutional, but it is up to Congress and the state legislative bodies to find ways to address it, such as the use of redistricting commissions. Now let's look at this a little more closely. Districts, districts drawn to influence an election using the criteria of race have to comply with more rules than cases where districts are drawn with partisan or political criteria alone. This has to do with the protections granted to minorities pursuant to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So what does this mean? It is often very difficult to distinguish between racial and partisan gerrymandering. The Supreme Court found in Rucho that racial discrimination claims are particularly hard to prove when the defendants claim a partisan motivation. This is where the state offers a defense saying, we did not move those voters because they are black. We moved them because they are Democrats. And under the current Supreme Court precedent, this motive is acceptable. This decision uh, and this precedent could lead legislators to believe that they can get away with racial gerrymandering in places where race and party are highly correlated by defending these claims on the basis that their decisions were made for partisan, not racial reasons. Under the Voting Rights Act, map drawers may, may take race into account if the intention is to preserve the voting rights of black and brown groups. Conversely, those who intend to disenfranchise those same racial groups hide under the label of partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering should not be used as a shield to do this. Now in Gill versus Whitford case, the Wisconsin case, an approach was used with a legal theory based on a new standard called the efficiency gap. It essentially counts, counts the number 
of votes each party wastes in an election to determine whether either, either party enjoyed a, system, a systemic advantage in turning votes into seats. It comes up with a number that captures and quantifies all of the packing and cracking decisions that make up a, dis, a districting plan. Some states have created independent redistricting commissions to reduce political drivers of redistricting. Let me say, we thank Governor Evers for appointing this independent nonpartisan commission to undertake the task of drawing Wisconsin's legislative districts for the next 10 years. Here in Wisconsin, voters in some 54 counties overwhelmingly voted to call upon map drawers to proceed with a fair, independent, transparent, and nonpartisan redistricting process. I, along with those I'm associated with, believe that redistricting should take place in a fair way that accounts for the size of a district's population and its racial and ethnic diversity. Now, I wish to highlight four points before concluding. One, please consider foremost the importance of a fair process that protects the integrity of voting as opposed to having it rigged to ensure that one party wins which renders voting meaningless and undermines democracy. Number two, due to the way maps are unfairly drawn and the close relationship between race and where people reside, partisan gerrymandering has the tendency to have a disparate impact on ethnic and minority voters who are packed into certain districts resulting in the dilution of their votes. Number three, partisan gerrymandering contributes mightily to the hyper polarization in our politics by making it more likely that candidates who are at the extremes of the political spectrum get elected, essentially turning the primary into the general election. Number four, if we desire to reform our politics and work toward achieving more unity in our civil and political discourse and in our state and nation as a whole, it starts with eliminating partisan gerrymandering and providing a system that involves fair electoral maps. Thank you. Thank you, James. Our final presenter uh, is Tehachi Hill, Chairman of the Oneida Nation. On behalf of the Oneida Nation, uh, Chairman Hill serves as a liaison to uh, the National Congress of American Indians. And he is also uh, on Natural Resources Damage Trustee Council and is a designee to the Environmental Protection, uh, Protection Agency's uh, Regional Tribal Operating Committee. Uh, prior to his current role, Chairman Hill has served two terms as a council member for the Oneida Business Com uh, Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Congressman Hill. Uh, good evening, Chairman Ford and Commissioners of the People's Map Commission. Uh, my name is Dehase Dazi. I am of the Bear Clan. My nation is people of the Standing Stone. I come from a place of bountiful ducks. Thank you for inviting me tonight to provide testimony on redistricting and mapping process and to hear a Native American perspective on behalf of Oneida Nation. The Oneida Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe with approximately 17,000 Oneida citizens worldwide. 4,471 or 26% of Oneida citizens live within the nation's reservation boundaries with approximately 8,000 or 49% of our citizens living within Brown and Outagamie counties. The reservation um, overlaps portions of Brown and Outagamie counties with a diverse community population of about 24,000 total res residents. <clears throat> 
Our reservation was established in 1838 and covers nearly 65,400 acres. The Oneida Nation operates a multifaceted government operation, successful business ventures, and a wide array of community development projects. And we have 149 direct service programs while employing approximately 2,091 people. The purpose of our inherent right to self-governance is to protect our health, safety, and welfare of our members while protecting our culture, revitalizing our language, and restoring the environment to improve the quality of life for the community as a whole. January uh, 2021 marks one year that the Oneida Nation and the entire world has been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. The physical, social, emotional, and economic impacts of the pandemic have been devastating and has left many governments, businesses, and families struggling to recover. The nation and our citizens were not immune to the impacts and like many tribal nations are doing their best to keep moving forward. Although the nation continues to respond to the pandemic, the nation is also taking steps toward economic recovery. While we're in the midst of recovery, we are committed to maintaining our language and our culture. The rich traditions, culture, and language are incorporated to the very fabric of our nation. For nearly 200 years, we have lived in Wisconsin. We have built a community that is proud and dedicated to the good mind, a good heart, and a strong fire. I believe this endeavor is important to provide you a little background about Native American tribes and bands located in Wisconsin. The federal government officially recognizes 574 American Indian Alaskan Native tribes and villages in the United States. Located in the borders of Wisconsin are 11 federally recognized tribes, which include uh, the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Ho-Chunk Nation, Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Lac de Flambeau, uh, Lake Superior Chippewa, Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin, Oneida Nation, Forest County, Potawatomi, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, St. Croix, Chicago Chippewa, and Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. Each tribe maintains a government to government relationship with the federal government and state of Wisconsin. Each tribe has its own unique history, traditions, customs, and language. As with any population, there are different social, economic, geographic conditions in American Indian communities. Today's 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin have established democratically elected governments, which provide leadership and services to our citizen members. The Native American population in Wisconsin dates back approximately 10,000 years according to archeological data. Some of that is evidence of which many of you already know of, seen or heard of, you know, effigy mounds that have been shaped with animals, some as burial mounds of Wisconsin's earliest residents of Native American people. The presence of European settlers drastically altered the lives of Native Americans. Quoting Patty Lowe, author of Indian Nations of Wisconsin, in the summer of 1634, the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi near present-day Green Bay awoke to a strange sight, a light-skinned visitor who arrived at their villages by canoe, bearing gifts and displaying metal objects the Ho-Chunks later described as thundersticks. As she describes, the visitor was John Nicolet, a French trader sent by a governor of New France in North America, Samuel Del Champlain, to negotiate peace between the Ho-Chunk and the Ottawa. To understand the history of the Native American perspective on our voting rights and the redistricting process, I believe it's important to also know the treaties between the United States government and the tribes and the United States government policy toward Native American tribes. The following excerpts are taken directly from information provided by the state of Wisconsin online resources providing historical background of Native American tribes in Wisconsin. In 1804, the U.S. government forced the Sac and Fox tribe to cede their land claims in southern Wisconsin in a treaty that they did not agree to. These actions led, uh, Black, led to the Black Hawk War of 1832. The largest American Indian population in Wisconsin, the Menominee, was pressured to sell, sell away nearly 11,600 square miles of land along the lower Fox River. The Treaty of Perry Duchene in 1825 was significant in the history of American Indians in Wisconsin after European settlement. 
The Treaty of Perry Duchene established a treaty of peace among the tribes and demarked boundaries between settlers and American Indians. By 1871, most Americans have most American Indians have been placed on reservations, and the government discontinued its use of trees with them. The government changed its focus to de-Indianizing this population, creating schools that attempted to rid them of their cultural traditions and way of life by breaking tribal ties and molding them into the image of white settlers. However, before this time, be between the late 19th century through the 1920s, the federal government aimed to mainstream American Indians through the policy of assimilation and allotment. Some of these schools included the Menominee Boarding School at Kashima, the Oneida Boarding School at Oneida, Lac de Flambeau Boarding School at Lac de Flambeau, and the Toma Industrial School at Toma. The Menominee, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ho Chunk people are among the original inhabitants of Wisconsin. Oneida Nation is originally from upstate New York. After the Revolutionary War, we lost nearly 5 million acres of our original homeland to the birth of the United States and the state of New York. Our people began to relocate to Wisconsin, led by Eliezer Williams. The Oneida settled on Menominee land along the Fox River near Green Bay. The Oneida numbered around 650 people by 1838 and signed a treaty the same year to establish reservation boundaries at that time that encompassed approximately 500,000 acres. In their attempt to assimilate the native populations, Congress passed the General Allotment Act 1887, or the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act changed ownership of tribal land to individual ownership of 80 acre parcel. The extra land was sold to whites to expose the American Indian population to mainstream society. Many people had lost, or many tribes had lost more of their land. For example, the Ojibwe lost more than 40% of their homelands in this act. In 1934, Congress passed the Reor Reorganization Act, the IRA. This <clears throat> reversed the Dawes Act and encouraged tribes to form tribal governments and draft constitutions and provide political bodies that could assert their sovereign rights. In the 1950s, critics began to gain ground in their opposition to the Reorganization Act and argued to dismantle the reservation system and free federal government from the cost of protecting American Indians and their property. The House Concurrent Resolution 108 created goals of termination and relocation, which were intended to move these populations from rural reservations to urban areas through job training programs and housing assistance. Most Wisconsin Indians who opted for this received a one-way bus ticket to Chicago, Milwaukee, or St. Paul. This termination policy ended the, the federal government's recognition of more than 50 tribal governments. For more than a century, Wisconsin tribes have fought to maintain their sovereignty and self-determination in the face of federal policies and assimilation, allotment, and termination. In the last generation, the tribe's legal status has been clearly defined their traditional treaty rights guaranteed and their economic base boosted by gaming and tourism. The following demographic data uh, is provided by the National Congress of American Indians. According to the 2010 Decentennial Census, 0.9% of the US population or 2.9 million people identified as American Indians or Alaska Natives alone, while 1.7% of US population or 5.2 million people identified as American Indian or Alaska Native alone or in combination with another race. This is an increase since 2000 of over 39%. With the upcoming 2020 centennial census, the population is expected to increase once again. Approximately 4,000 or 4,871,103 million American Indians and Alaska Natives are voting age. Approximately 29% of American Indians and Alaska Natives are under the age of 18 while 21% of the total U.S. population is under 18. The median age of the reservation is 29, while the median age of the total U.S. population is 38. According to the U.S. Census Bureau 2018 population estimates, the states with the highest uh, 
proportion of American Indian Alaska Natives are Alaska at 27%, Oklahoma at 17%, New Mexico at 14.5%, South Dakota at 12%, and Montana at 9.2%. By 2060, the projected U.S. American Indian Alaska Native population is estimated to reach 10 million people, or approximately 2.4% of the U.S. population. Based on the 2010 U.S. Census and health data provided by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, 22% of American Indians and Alaska Natives live on reservations or trust land. 60% of American Indians and Alaska Natives live in metropolitan areas approximately 1.5 million American Indians, Alaska Natives, are under the age of 18, making up 30% of this population. Among American Indians and Alaska Natives aged 25 and over, 82% have earned at least a high school diploma, and 17% have earned at least a bachelor's degree. Additionally, 6% of American Indian and Alaska Native ages 25 and over have uh, at least an advanced degree. According to the 2010 census, Wisconsin had approximately 86,000 people who identified as Native American, or 1.2% of the state's population, with more than 17,000 living on reservations or trust lands. In an effort to provide insight to Oneida Nation's priorities in the People's Maps Condition Commission and redistricting process, these are my responses to the questions posed online. Oneida Nation supports an independent redistricting process. It is important for the commission and other policymakers of this matter to learn from the historical and contemporary experiences of Native Americans throughout the United States. Nationally, Native American voters have been marginalized through discriminatory redistricting practices such as racial and cultural vote dilution, intimidation, distance to voting locations, and forms of voter suppression tactics, such as uh, restrictive voter identification requirements. It is therefore important to not only include tribes in community input sessions, but also actively engage individual tribal communities and their leaders in this redistricting mapping process. Again, Oneida Nation is one of federal, 11 federally recognized Indian tribes in Wisconsin. Oneida Nation wishes to see stronger Native American communities of interest in the Congressional, State Senate, State Assembly redistricting process. The process should recognize Native American tribes' historic and contemporary relationships with each other, with the state government, and concerning cultural preservation, sovereignty, and economic development. The redistricting process should provide American, Native Americans with a reasonable opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. The redistricting process should also reflect the specific wishes of individual tribes. Further, while many tribes, tribal members live on reservations, we believe it is important that the redistricting process recognize and incorporate to the largest extent possible Native Americans residing in nearly near proximity to reservation boundaries. Again, the goal is a stronger Native American community of interest. Again, on behalf of the Oneida Nation, I wish to thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening to the best of, uh, to all of you, uh, which means, which is Oneida for best wishes. I'll be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Now we'll go. Thank you, Chairman Hill, for taking the time. Um, we are now going to open up the floor to any questions that the commissioners may have for this evening's presenters. I'll go in order of congressional districts first, uh, beginning with the first congressional district. Due to time constraints, as we've done before in the past, we'll limit the first round of questions to one question per commission members. And if time allows, as we go back around, uh, we can open up for additional questions once every commissioner has had the opportunity to ask a question. Um, if any commissioners would like to pass, please let me know and uh, let, let me know when I call your name. So uh, we can begin in the first congressional district with Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Chair Ford. And um, at this point in time, I do not have any questions, but I just do want to thank um, all of the presenters for sharing their perspectives and their data with us. I think this is incredibly important as uh, the commission moves forward. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. Commissioner Anthony from the 2nd Congressional District. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair Ford, uh, for bringing this uh, wonderful group of presenters in front of us. My question is directed uh, to all three presenters. What do you see is the biggest barrier to um, um, electing uh, representative um, uh, bureaucracies or representative uh, democracies uh, for your different demographic areas, African-Americans, uh, Latinx, and Native Americans? I, I'll go first, if, unless my co-presenters have a desire to jump in here. All right, thank you both. Um, I, I would say that the, the biggest challenge to date, particularly for the Latinx community, is a lack of accountability for legislators across the state of Wisconsin. Um, I think that, you know, Latinos are, are beginning to, to move further south and west uh, in the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County. So I think in some respects that may dilute the vote further and that is a challenge. But the, the greater challenge is that on these, these policies that, that would benefit the, the Latino community but also would benefit Wisconsin as a whole, in, in these districts where they are, as um, Attorney Hall so, so beautifully pointed out, are, are, are politically gerrymandered even in Northern Wisconsin, where you may have support from those individuals who would vote Republican for initiatives and bills that would benefit the Latino community and the business community in those areas, um, there's, uh, there's no incentive for the representative to, to vote in that way because their district is secure. And so we see a lack of compromise and we see a lack of willingness to come to the table and work through solutions because there's no consequence if they fail to do so. And because so many of our elections now are focused on the primaries um, and, and oftentimes it is the individuals who are more extreme and, and less uh, compromising that are, are successful in the primary system, uh, they went out and, and then we don't see an opportunity for, for legislation that, that is truly going to benefit both the Latino community, but also the state of Wisconsin as a whole. And then, as I said, secondarily, I do think that because the Latino community is continuing to, to uh, disperse further throughout the state, some of that might um, make it more difficult to, to elect representation. Thank you. Um, I will just um, segue or, or piggyback from what Attorney Lopez is saying there. Um, as, as she described, in terms of communities of color, because, well, I will say, when you said what are the biggest challenges, I'll come back to the point that the, the fact that this commission exists and presumably will make recommendations that are based on a, a, a nonpartisan and independent and fair uh, process, you know, that's welcome uh, because when the legislature does it and when they, when legislatures draw maps that are designed to just, um, you know, promote their interest and continue to elect legislators of that party, in a major as a majority, uh, the maps tend to be drawn in a way that um, dilute the votes of citizens of color because they tend to be, you know, packed into certain districts, and the the the, the districts are drawn in a way to allow, um, you know, to allow uh, uh, those parties to win regardless of the outcome. It's no secret, um, it, it's, it's factual information that uh, a majority of uh, citizens of color tend to vote Democratic. Uh, and that's been discussed in the cases and so forth. So if, 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 if Republicans are here in Wisconsin, if you're, if you're drawing districts in a way to, um, to pack these citizens into um, certain districts and have more districts where 
um, the other the, the other party, that being Republicans, will win, then it really uh, does a disservice to the uh, citizens of color who are packed into those districts and denied, um, um, you know, denied a a a um, the the concept of one person one vote in terms of their vote having meaning. And as I talked about earlier, when this can be done on the basis of partisan or political gerrymandering and 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 thereby um, um, you know, uh, presumed to not be unconstitutional. You know, that's a that's a real problem, and that's why it's important, as the Supreme Court has said, extreme gerrymandering is 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 still you know it's wrong, it's unfair, it's undemocratic. So the biggest challenge is to really um, draw maps in a way that take into account. Uh, the population, uh, the diversity that try to give a tend to give a voice to everyone, um, as um, Mr. Hill described, and as Attorney Lopez described as well, it's important to be able to represent uh, to have the communities of color have their voices represented and heard, and to elect people who. Um, represent their interests. So those are the challenges as I see it. Thank you, Attorney Hall. Yeah, I think it's important. I, I, I think uh, I touched on it a bit as well in some of my uh, testimony as well about the kind of the, the historical significance of the federal Indian policy uh, of removal and or, or assimilation. Um, so a lot of our populations as I noted in, my, in the demographics, are actually not located on reservations. They're located in uh, Milwaukee, essentially, um, or Chicago or St. Paul uh, for the Midwest region here. And so a lot of our, I guess, voting power is already uh, kind of disseminated through federal policy, um, taking our voting block and dispersing our people across the state and across the country for that matter. And so um, I think that's an important uh, aspect of the information I shared is, you know, if you look at the map of the, of the state of Wisconsin, where the tribes reservations are located, kind of the, the green bit along, the, along the Lake Michigan, Lake Superior and the Mississippi River, kind of on the edges of the state of Wisconsin, mostly. And then, and then you look at uh, a population census of Native Americans, the vast uh, you know, majority are living in urban areas, the large urban areas, which for the most part don't have reservations. Um, Green Bay is a little bit different with Oneida being right here on the uh, sharing a boundary, but um, for the most part, you know, Madison and, and Milwaukee, well, Madison has a little bit of Ho-Chunk there as well, but, you know, these larger population centers are where our people were sent um, as a part of that federal Indian policy. And so, that's having a long lasting detrimental effect on our Native American voting block, uh, trying to make sure that we're electing people in, in and around our reservations that represent uh, our needs of our communities and our asks of the federal government and state governments, local and uh, governments as well. And so that dispersing of our, our vote has been um, guided, I guess, essentially by, you know, federal Indian policy, not necessarily at this, until this more recent um, juncture of the gerrymandering. And so, you know, that's why I'm pretty passionate about this particular topic is because it's been happening to us for a very, very long time and not at just the state level, but a, a federal level um, and through those federal policies. And so um, that's why I'm making sure that I have the opportunity to participate, and I, I, I'm very uh, thankful for this opportunity to share our perspective. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, from the 3rd Congressional District, Commissioner McClellan. Hi, and thank uh, all three presenters for so much information to take in. It's very informative, and 
it gives us motivation to continue forward. And one of the things the commission has been talking about, as you might know, is um, communities of interest and uh, defining them and identifying them. Um, and listening to the three speakers, we understand how important it is that we continue with that. And uh, it's real motivation to do our work. Um, my question is for Ms. Lopez. Um, and I'm wondering about the Latino population in Trempolo County. Would you consider that to be a community of interest? And, um, and how would you define the community of interest uh, as far as describing it and, and location? So, so I, I know that there is a specific threshold under the Voting Rights Act. And, and um, the disclaimer being that I am not an expert in the Voting Rights Act. I actually practice employment law. This is a, more of a passion interest for me. Um, but I would consider those Latinos in Trempolo County and specifically in Arcadia, um, where they're making up, I, I couldn't find an official statistic, but some articles referenced as much as 46% of the population. And, and largely to be credited for the population growth in that area when the population was actually in a decline. So I, I think that is a, a community that is going to um, continue to grow in the next 10 years over the time that these maps would be in place. And, and I would, um, I'd be wary of setting a specific percentage threshold um, uh, but I, I would say that in, in any of those communities, um, like the ones that I highlighted on the slides where um, the, the community is, is more than I, perhaps, um, I, I, I would look both at, at both their representation, but then also their growth over, over the last uh, three years, because uh, even in just the last three years, the population growth of the Latino community uh, in, in many areas um, has increased substantially and it is largely to credit for the population increases in those areas uh, because um, other communities and other um, individuals of, of different racial backgrounds, the, the, um, the population is actually on the decline. So, so that's what I would suggest that you take a look at. And I can provide resources as to where you can find some of those figures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rangel from the 4th Congressional District. Yeah, thank you, Chair Ford. Uh, thank you to all our presenters. Just a ton of really valuable, important information. I got a, a list of questions here, so hopefully we can get uh, around the different con commissioners a few times here. Um, my first question is for uh, Ms. Lopez. Um, could you, uh, you, you offered a, a ton of gra uh, great information on the, on the Baldus case. Uh, but I might have gotten lost sort of in the end in terms of the actual final decision the court had made. Could you just clarify, did the court say that the districts had to be majority minority or was it okay being two districts that were heavily influenced by the Latino population? Yes, thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. So what the court said was that the Voting Rights Act does not protect or provide a basis for influence districts. Uh, it only allows the court to intervene and, and protects in, in the establishment of uh, majority minority districts. And so the court ordered that the maps relative to District 8 and District 9 in Milwaukee be redrawn so that District 8 would be a minority majority district and District 9 then ultimately became a district of influence. Okay, great. And if I could, I uh, just wanted to clarify that um, the Baldus case, uh, that was in a federal district court. Okay. And so that wasn't ever like revisited by the U.S. Supreme Court or, um, okay. Um, no, that determination, yeah, that determination was made at, in the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and then, so this is sort of the, the meat of the question related to that case. When, when the court made the rulings or the attorneys argued in that case, did they, um, when they were trying to like clarify or designate uh, the district boundaries and like whether or not the Latino population could influence the vote, um, like heavily influence the vote, did they use uh, primary or general election data? That's a great question. They actually looked at both. And, and what the, the court stated uh, in that particular case was that, um, in, in that district, 
um, it was agreed that that the individuals living in that district, regardless of race, largely voted Democrat. I'll, I'll, I'll put a little asterisk there. It's important to note that a, a larger percentage of the Latino population actually does identify as Republican than, than some other underrepresented communities. And so I don't um, want to forget to note that you know, the Latino community, while they largely and mostly vote with the Democratic Party, that is not uniform. Um, but in, in this case and in those districts, both the, the um, Latino community and the other communities that are represented largely, largely voted Democratic. And so what the court noted was that the, the primaries were really where the election was at. And so um, looking at the trends of voting patterns, participation, and disenfranchisement, the court stated that we had to look at the primaries as well um, and looked at that data. Okay, and then la last like sub question here, sorry for my commissioners for taking up so much time here, but in, the, in that case, um, uh, when they look at the, it's kind of a similar question, do they use just straight up demographic census data like who um, identified on the census as Latino, or do they also, when I say they, I mean the attorneys, the court, do they look at actual voter turnout knowing that uh, black indigenous people of color are often disenfranchised through different laws? So they, do they only look at demographics or can they also look at like actual real voter turnout by demographic? Yeah, so um, in, in this particular case, it's important to note that the, the defendant expert failed to refute much information and relied largely on his own supposition, which, which the court critiqued pretty heavily. And so it was the plaintiff's expert that presented evidence and they looked at it as a whole. They looked at the facts and circumstances in making their determination. And so some of the things that they considered were um, whether the individuals were actually able to vote with a recognition that a portion of the Latino community may not have citizenship status. Um, they looked at age. And so the percentages then of who would be eligible to vote dropped in both those districts. And then they looked, uh, they, I, I believe in my reading of it, they factored for the fact that not, uh, there wasn't as much voter participation. And so that, that was something that they considered. Thank you so much. That's all I got. Uh, Commissioner Ram from the fifth. Thank you, Chair Ford. Thank you for, to everyone for um, educating us this evening. My question is for Mr. Hill. Um, you mentioned um, the 11 um, federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin. Could you share with us how we can most effectively gather the voices from each of the 11 tribes, um, you know, so that we are representing the communities of interest within the community, if you will? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think um, you know, I participate. I'm actually the secretary treasurer of the Great Lakes Intertribal Council. So that um, actually rep only represents 10 of the 11 fairly recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the reason we have 11 participants is because we have uh, Lake Vitas there, which is located on the border of the UP. Um, they participate with our, our, our council. Um, uh, Forest County, Potawatomi does not. But so a lot of the times, um, a lot of information and requests uh, actually go to Great Lakes Intertribal Council to get uh, direct feedback from uh, 10 of the 11 tribal mm -hmm. chairman, chairmen, chairpersons, presidents um, for that feedback. Okay, thank you. We'll certainly follow up. Um, Commissioner Princess from the sixth. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question at this time, but I did want to just thank the three of you so much for uh, for joining us tonight and this the the wealth of information you shared and and to echo what Commissioner McClellan said, the communities of interest issue and, and the VRA are um, things that I have found really interesting in this process and and think are really important. So this has really given me a lot to think about in terms of those things. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bissonnette from the 7th. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you to all three of you. That, it's, uh, um, it's really good information. I, I do have a question for a, a Attorney Hall. Um, and 
So one of the things that the, the commission is looking at doing right now is establishing a criteria. Um, some of the things uh, we, we've talked about communities of interest. Um, so my question is, uh, and Anne-Marie kind of took some of my question, which is not, a, not unusual, she does that. But um, uh, my, my question is, could in an attempt to maintain a community of interest, could that be misconstrued as racial gerrymandering? Does that make sense? So if we're looking at trying to, to uh, keep a, a tribal nations together, could that be misconstrued as a, a racial gerrymandering? Or am I wrong? I, uh, I think you're on mute. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I guess it could be. I think a key factor is to look at um, sort of a totality of the circumstances, which would include, you know, equal pop, trying to have districts that are as near equal population as possible, uh, continuity of interest boundaries, um, community of interest, um, all of those types of things. Now, if, if um, I, 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 is your question, you know, if, if, if people of a particular uh, racial or ethnic group are packed into a particular district, I mean, due to where they reside, are you saying with that, you know, could that be considered racial gerrymandering? Is that your question? I think it could be. That could um, be my question. Um, yeah, I, I guess what I'm, you know, if our intent, if our intent is to look at community, uh, communities of interest and we wanna, um, like, we wanna keep those together, I guess. Right. And regardless, I, I, I don't know. I I'm just I I want to make sure that we're if we have the right intent that that couldn't be misconstrued as like you're packing people in. Right. Well, I think a key thing to keep in mind there's an obligation under the the Voting Rights the Voting Rights Act to. Um, you know, try to ensure that um, uh, the particular groups that we are talking about have a voice, and that they, you know, they, they, um, you know, if 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 it's one district or if it's several districts that they may be included in, where their voice can be heard, and it's important to look at all the factors that would go into that. So if it's um, if it's really a situation of, 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 of pack, I think the key is if it's a matter of, I'll use the term, packing people into a particular district to allow, um, to allow uh, a political party to achieve or obtain advantage, you know, by prevailing in other districts, you know, that's the type of thing that, you know, we're trying to avoid with partisan gerrymandering. Now that has to be balanced against, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act, which, 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 you know, would require, you know, using race as a factor in, or considering race as a factor in, in promoting the voting power of, of these same groups. Uh, that's what you know. Uh, uh, you know, certainly it's um, as I try to say in my, you know, primary testimony, the overlap um, is is um, you know makes it you know um, um, a bit complex, and 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 the problem becomes when partisan gerrymandering is used as a shield for actually. Um, confining people 
you know, uh, of a certain race or ethnicity in a way that dilutes their vote. So there's an interplay there that, you know, even the Supreme Court cases discuss that this is, um, you know, this is the challenge. I, I, I don't know if I'm you know, answering you at all, but that's, you know, I, I'm, my answer recognizes the, the, the difficulty in, in the question that you're raising. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'd like to be able to be more clear, but um, you know, I can, even even the cases in discussing it. That's why you know the court has said um, in in the case I mentioned, Rucho, and in other cases that um, it, it's a uh, um, uh, you know there's an interplay here between you know race and partisanship. That makes the issue difficult. And one thing that I will say, this isn't in direct answer to your question, but while I'm speaking, I just wanted to, if I may, um, comment on something that uh, when in the last question, attorney Lopez pointed out that uh, more um, Latino individuals or Hispanic individuals vote Republican than than one might think, or then with certain other groups of color, I, I would I hasten to mention that in my comments when I I talked about how Republicans have benefited from gerrymandering uh, in Wisconsin over the you know past decade. You know, I'm speaking gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering is bad. Whichever party does it, both parties do it, and I didn't I don't mean by my comments to imply that only Republicans do it. In some other states, it, it, I, I'm, I'm mentioning that because in Wisconsin, that's what we've been dealing with, you know, recently here. But for instance, in Maryland, it's the Democrats that have done it. And it's a, a similar type situation, although uh, uh, they, in instances where they may have gotten less of a, than a majority of votes, they maintain a majority of seats. So the point is, both parties do it and it's bad. I know that deviates from your question, Commissioner, but I just wanted to get that in while speaking. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Phillips from the East. Yes, thank you. And thank you for all those speakers. Uh, my question is directed at Tassie Hill, but you know, there's overlap with all the uh, minority communities. Uh, one of our missions as the People's Map Commission is to understand, you know, what has the effect of gerrymandering been on both districts and people across the whole state, and therefore what could benefit if there wasn't gerrymandering, if there was nonpartisan redistricting. So I was struck, uh, Mr. Hill, by your comments that Oneida supports nonpartisan redistricting, and then you mentioned both voting dilution and voting suppression methods, and you started listing some of those, and uh, what I ask you to do is expand a little bit on that, the, the ways in which you think an end to gerrymandering could help uh, the population of Native Americans uh, have more voting power, specifically as regards to the voting suppression. Yes, yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's, uh, it's an important uh, aspect. Um, I think the reason why I put so much history in my part of my, uh, my presentation of uh, comments uh, because of the, I guess, the uniqueness of tribes, uh, federally, in particular, federally recognized tribes, um, uh, were, were distinct um, uh, government entities. And we get classified as a government and also a race. And so that kind of puts us in a, an odd position as um, uh, the commissioner's last question about um, putting those Native Americans into you know one district or or kind of the, the reverse of what's been happening as being uh, a process as well and so uh, I think I wanted to touch on that a little bit as as well as a part of that that question and relating to the previous question that uh, Native Americans are are quite unique 
and being a political entity, but then also being U.S. citizens and citizens of their, their tribal nation as well. And so that's a lot of the reason why I put a lot of that history there was try to kind of fill in some of those blanks and try to uh, make more people aware of, uh, I guess, the how we got to where we're at right now with, um, with Native Americans in particular um, and the effects that uh, that federal policy has had on Native Americans and their location of where they where they now reside. Uh, like I said, there's like maybe, you know, 20 percent of uh, of our whole population live in, you know, the, uh, the city of Milwaukee, which isn't our reservation, and then has been affected by, uh, you know, gerrymandering. And, and so, you know, I think those are those effects, but I guess that would be the request of this commission in consideration as in my comments of mentioning uh, Native Americans that aren't just living on reservations, but also near reservations to be able to be counted as a part of you know, that districting. Because uh, we've seen it uh, throughout our history of uh, kind of the divide and conquer aspects of uh, federal Indian policy. Um, not only that, but also with um, uh, the, the assimilation parts of it, having my reservation here, I think has like five or six different school districts that crisscross our reservation. So the majority of our Oneida students don't go to our our own school. They are, they go to several public schools that um, are border our reservation, and the same has happened also with um, uh, uh, the amount and the type of religious practices on the reservations that were established here. I think there's I think it was like eight or nine different uh, churches within the reservation. An another way to further divide our people from our culture and each other and our families. And so I just want to make sure that we're uh, maybe more acutely aware of what has happened to the, the Native American populations throughout out history and how that has had a detrimental effect. But I think, uh, I guess my main ask for this commission would be um, that our reservations not be divided and potentially um, that uh, people, Native American people living near reservations be also be able to be included as a part of that, you know, that district. And again, I think that's just trying to, you know, reverse the, uh, the centuries of uh, the different types of uh, federal Indian policy that we've, you know, faced um, and that we're really, um, I guess, coming into our own as it comes to uh, the, the educational aspects that I shared as well, that our population is becoming more educated than, than ever before. And in particular with Oneida, you know, we do a lot to make sure that our students graduate high school and that they have uh, the financial capability to go on to college and get technical degrees and uh, bachelor's and master's and doctorate degrees. And so we're really making strides to making sure that, you know, our community participates. We have a very large get out the vote um, activities under normal years. Uh, this past year, not so much with social gathering uh, uh, bands and things like that, but we really try to make sure that our people participate. And, and again, that is non, nonpartisan uh, participation. We just encourage everyone to, to get out and vote and to talk to the candidates, get to know what they believe and what their thoughts are and try to you know, pick someone that represents your vote. And that makes it a little bit difficult with, you know, gerrymandering and then the, you know, the, the disbursement of our people across the entire state. So, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of that, that, that voting block power to elect people from our areas that um, are sympathetic to our causes, I guess, to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I had a question for, I got a, a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, <laughs> I'll, I'll do this one here. Uh, but uh, for uh, Mr. Hall, um, just in 
in the purview of the uh, Voting Rights Act, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to pull um, a lot of resources from experts on the um, uh, on the subjects, uh, different subjects of creation of a map. One thing um, that we've seen in other commissions throughout the country, independent commissions like ourselves, uh, is that a couple of them have um, you know communities of interest, uh, subcommittees as we do, uh, but they also pull from uh, attorneys or whatever legal resources they can pull from uh, regards to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, so in particular, and th this could be uh, for, for you too, uh, Rebecca, you know, do you guys have any, uh, I know this isn't your your, your, your area of expertise, but um, uh, passion more so, but uh, do you guys have any resources that we can pull from or any uh, suggestions in terms of um, to remain as much as we can within the Voting Rights Act uh, parameters? Um, am I on? Okay. Yeah, in terms of um, legal resources or, or individuals who may provide some resource information, yes, I, I can. Uh, may I follow up with the commission or with Molly um, in providing a couple names? Absolutely. In, yeah, I, I, I'm, I can do that. And I'm aware of um, uh, some people. Uh, some individuals who I think would be most helpful and I would consider, you know, experts in the area who can provide that information. I, like attorney Lopez, I, you know, this is a passion for me. My large part of my practice is uh, civil rights and civil liberties generally and employment work. And I, you know, but I can give the names of some individuals who I think would be um, very appropriate resources. I'll follow up with that. Thank you. I'll do the same. Thank you. All right, so um, just in case anyone else has any uh, other questions, we can kind of go from the top. And again, if you don't have any other ones, then uh, feel free uh, to let me know. So um, uh, uh, Commissioner Tobias from the first? Uh, no questions, sir. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Anthony? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one last question, and this could be addressed to any one of our, our presenters. How do the stars need to line up to break gerrymandering here in Wisconsin? And uh, can we expect to make progress in the 2020 decennial census? Um, I think one of the, the challenges, you asked the question about challenges earlier, and um, I, I, I will flag this one for right now as, as it relates to the 2020 um, census, which is, as we know, uh, there was a politi political hot button as to whether or not the um, category of, of citizenship status or immigration status was going to be included on the census. Um, I don't know how the numbers are going to shake yet. But I think there's, a, I have a concern personally that with COVID-19 and then with um, the, the scare tactics that were targeted largely at the immigrant community and, and largely influenced Latino community, I'm concerned that the census numbers may not accurately reflect how large our community is. Um, and and that, that could be a, a significant challenge as, as you are evaluating the numbers, because I, I worry that it will um, not accurately reflect the, the population that is in Wisconsin today. Um, I, I would say that it is important for this process to be transparent. I will echo um, Mr. Chairman Hill and Mr. Attorney Hall in, in saying that um, you know, while there are some challenges legislatively, <laughs> I, I am a strong advocate and supporter of what this committee is, this commission is doing and all of your work. The fact that it's transparent and you're giving an opportunity for the public to be heard. Um, our, our system of government is supposed to be for the people, by the people, not for a party, by a party, not for a person, by a person, but the people. And so I, I'm strongly supportive of the work that you're doing here in, in giving a voice to the people, a platform. And, and I, I would strongly hope that, that the work that you're doing um, will be supported by the legislature moving forward. Thank you. Um, I, 
uh, echo what uh, was just said and um, would say the fact, the mere fact that this commission is in existence and that you're having hearings around the state, taking testimony, considering the types of things we are talking about is a start, uh, an important uh, step in terms of as uh, you ask Commissioner Anthony in terms of the stars lining up to uh, have a, a different outcome. Uh, consider that in the, the way it has been done previously, rather than being in a transparent environment, getting all of this type of input that this commission is getting, it's when it's, when it's been done in a back room in, in, by just a group of legislators pouring over a map and deciding how to carve out districts that help them win. I mean, that's very, and stay in power. That's very different than what you're doing here taking into account the various things we're, you're, we're talking about, including um, trying to have districts that are, you know, uh, as equal in population as possible, uh, communities of interest, uh, but at the same time, uh, giving a voice to uh, various groups and, and all the other factors. I think the point that attorney uh, Lopez made is very important in terms of the count, you know, considering considering um, you know, everyone uh, and not just, uh, you know, as she alluded to, there was an attempt to impose the citizenship, citizenship question and to try to not count certain people. That's um, to be avoided. And um, so I think all of these uh, steps that are being taken uh, line uh, uh, ways of lining the stars up to have a different outcome than what we had in the past. And, again, and I would just reemphasize that getting fair districts, getting um, having a fair map that would allow for uh, districts that are not created based on partisanship is so important to ending up with a legislature that uh, is more representative of the people that can function and operate. One of the problems when you have a partisan um, designed, you have a districting based on partisanship where districts are such that that party will win regardless, as we've alluded to, it allows candidates to to run and be elected who are at the extremes, as opposed to if that district is uh, consisting of a more diverse group of people, then that candidate in candidates in running for office have to appeal to a broader spectrum, political spectrum, and therefore in office have, you know, are more inclined to talk and compromise and to reach uh, um, you know, um, outcomes that please a broader constituency rather than just the, being on the extreme where they don't have to worry about these other people because they know they're safe and we be, will be elected regardless. And that's whether it's Democrat or Republican. So that's very important. I mean, we know our legislature has been uh, in a position where it's been unable to act on many matters and our federal government as well. Uh, and, and I think this gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering is a key factor there. So I think this is a, a, a very positive step in lining the stars up to, you know, to, to create a, um, an outcome that's fair and just. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think, you know, my comments are pretty much going to mirror uh, Ms. Lopez and Mr. Hall's comments as well. So I, I won't repeat exactly what they said, but, you know, I think it's just important that we continue to work towards making sure that this uh, democratic system works and that, you know, people are allowed to uh, elect people who represent, you know, their interests in that particular, you know, area 
I think the geo geopolitical lines that are drawn, um, I think are, are, are imaginary lines, I guess, that, uh, that affects the outcomes of people's lives. And that, that's so important that we pay close attention to where those lines are. And that as Mr. Hall was explaining, you know, that, you know, that, that's very good explanation. I, I, I really like that um, as making sure that uh, being able to meet in the middle, you know, with the extremisms that we've seen from both the left and the right, I think is not allowing for the legislative and democratic process to work for the people, as Ms. Hall was saying. So I really uh, encourage this commission to continue its work and to get as broad of uh, feedback from, you know, other Wisconsinites as possible to assure that, you know, our voices are being heard and they're being listened to and that hopefully a, a fair process um, for the de democratic process will be uh, uh, put forth from this commission and hopefully it gets supported. And so again, I commend the commission for taking on this task and, and listening to hopefully a, a diverse population and making sure that uh, we all have some sort of representation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McClellan. Uh, I have no questions, but just thanks to everyone for this important discussion. Commissioner Ringo. Yeah, uh, wonderful conversation so far. Great information. My next question is for um, Mr. Uh, Hill. Um, so I was thinking about like ways, uh, just like kind of thinking forward to when we're actually in the process of drawing the maps, which is getting closer and closer every single month here we have these hearings and it's getting more and more real and our responsibilities made more and more clear. And, it, and in this conversation especially is like, um, I, I think highlights for me especially, and I probably for all the commissioners, the, the just reinforces the, the amount of responsibility we have to make sure people's voices are heard and, and people are, are seen in the democratic process. The one concern I have is uh, just looking at like the, the need to have districts, uh, I'm thinking the smallest districts at the assembly level the need to have them uh, equal size, which um, I would love for one of my commissioners to jump in here, but I think means about around 60,000 people per district, or si is that per assembly district? I don't know if that's, okay, I see Tony's uh, nodding his head yes. And knowing the, the relatively like small number of in indigenous uh, people throughout the state of Wisconsin, um, uh, and, and then to your point that some of them, a good chunk of them are actually in the city of Milwaukee. If you took the, the percentage, I saw somewhere it might've been 40%, but I heard you reference 20%. Um, if we try to make a majority minority district of like the indigenous community who lives in Milwaukee, which I don't know if would even be possible given the fact that I don't know where they live in Milwaukee. I'm not assuming that they're all in one, um, one location, despite the segregation that exists in the city of Milwaukee. Um, I guess I, my point is like, I don't know like, do you have any recommendations or um, advice um, in how to still create, potentially create a majority minority district for the indigenous community uh, and indigenous community here in, in Wisconsin, um, while taking into account that there, the population might not just like, might not allow that to happen just because there's um, not enough uh, individuals who identify Native American who live in close proximity with, with one another. Do you, do you understand my question? Yeah, I, th I think so. And I think a lot of that information um, would come from our, our demographics. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, each, each tribal nation is quite uh, unique. And, uh, and so I'm not sure what all type of inf demographic information the other tribes uh, track on a regular basis. So we have a trust and enrollment committee who uh, actually, you know, tracks um, uh, where our tribal members live, you know, throughout the, the counties, the state, the, the United States and in different parts of the world. And so uh, we're, we're able to probably uh, provide that information like in Milwaukee, whether I'm not sure how detailed down it would get to like zip code maybe. Um, but I think that's something that, you know, each one of the tribes might be able to uh, provide the 
the, the commission as, as a population density map, you know, might be per zip code. I'm not uh, sure how detailed uh, that could get, but I think that's um, one way to try to figure out how Native Americans, you know, across the state can have uh, their vote, you know, I guess measured and counted, you know, appropriately, you know, uh, within whichever district or districts across the state. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ram from the fifth. Thanks. My question is for Ms. Lopez. Um, you know, we understand that the Latino uh, community is not monolithic, and you described that with increasing diversity, um, la the Latino population is voting in a more of a diverse way. Um, and as we approach this work, we really want to consider as you know, few assumptions as possible as we approach it. Can you describe a little bit more about the communities of interest within the community, within the Latino community? So, you know, we want to avoid big swath generalizations. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the various communities within? All right, can you hear me okay? I'm not quite sure what happened there. <laughs> um, so um, just briefly, I, I would say, Taking the ones that I that I know most um, from personal experience and from the work that I did in Senator Feingold's office. So when we talk about the the Mexican uh, American community or the Chicano community within Wisconsin, um, you have varying generations. Um, as I mentioned, there are Mexicanos that immigrated to the United States um, or were already part of the United States before the border crossed them. Um, in Texas, and and so there are individuals who are of uh, Mexican American descent, um, and similarly of uh, of Puerto Rican descent, who um, have been here for a very long time. But particularly in our rural areas, you see um, an increase in those who are more recently arrived to Wisconsin, whether from other parts of the state or from their uh, country in Mexico, Central America, or South America. Um, I think that it's important to note as well that um, the, the Puerto Rican community, um, they, they are citizens, they have a right to vote. Um, they don't have some of the same challenges, let's say, as it relates to driver's licenses. You do see the, the, the Mexican American community and the Puerto Rican community oftentimes coalesce around these issues, however, because um, unfortunately, uh, the, the issue of racial profiling is something that, that does occur across all, um, all of the Latino community. And so even though um, those coming from Puerto Rico don't have the same challenges from an immigration standpoint, um, they, they nonetheless are oftentimes supportive on those issues uh, because they have experienced or suffered some of the repercussions associated with racial profiling. Um, Oftentimes, those from the Caribbean or from Central America who have come to Wisconsin are actually coming from the East Coast. There's large communities of those from Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic who, um, who maybe had gone to New York or, or, or Philadelphia first. Or, or Florida, and then found themselves coming to Wisconsin. Um, whereas with the Mexican American community, when you see migration from within the United States, oftentimes they're coming from states from the South and Southwest. Um, and so that, that also is different. Um, and as I mentioned, just politically, uh, there are the Latinos tend to largely be Catholic, but that's changing substantially in the present day. So from like a religious background, um, you see much more diversity in faith. Okay. Um, Commissioner Princess from the sixth. Uh, no questions at this time, but thank you all again. And thank you to my fellow commissioners for your really great questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bissonnette from the 7th. Um, I, I have no questions. I, I just want to say again, I appreciate everyone being here. 
Yeah, Commissioner Phillips from the East. Yeah, just a quick question for Rebecca Lopez. Uh, specifically, how would ending gerrymandering improve the support for small businesses for the Latinx population? We saw this a lot at the federal level, but unfortunately during COVID-19, the Latino community was largely disenfranchised um, as a result of stipulations put into legislation as it related to stimulus checks going out to mixed status families within the United States, which disproportionately negatively impacted the Latino community. Similarly, um, as it related to the PPP loans and the process by which there was access to those. So that's just one example whereby the Latino community, um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, a Latino being uh, elected to represent um, uh, Wisconsin in our federal legislature. And so, as you can see, um, that, that had an impact and, and we saw that happen and, and play out across the United States. Um, similarly, Latino businesses um, have been supportive of initiatives like the driver's licenses, but also funding for startups um, that, would, that would benefit individuals who are entrepreneurs and, and any sort of initiatives um, in particular that are, that are focused on underrepresented communities, uh, as far as I'm aware, have um, not gained much traction in our state legislature. And I believe, again, that's as a result of the fact that um, there is no incentive to compromise and it's difficult to hold individuals accountable. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so I'll, I'll finish out here. Uh, it's not more so of a question, but more so of a request uh, from all of our experts today. So one of the things that we'll be working with the um, uh, with the group from Tufts uh, with is in terms of getting information from communities of interest throughout the state. Um, and one of those uh, endeavors that we'll be doing is uh, reaching out to certain groups, um, organizations, things like that uh, within the communities of interest uh, to determine you know, if they want to provide us with additional information about their community. Um, and in some cases, even work with some of the software that we'll have uh, available to us so they can kind of you know, draw districts similar to you know, what they would find as being the best supportive district uh, for their community. So, um, you know, here's the ask. If you guys have any um, of those resources, any of those groups um, uh, that would be interested in such an endeavor, like feel free to either reach out to myself or um, any of our contacts uh, to see if we can um, uh, get on the same page and get that information distributed to them. Well, thank you all uh, for your questions tonight. And thank you all to all of our presenters as well uh, for coming out and spending time with us. It was very informative. And, um, you know, I feel like in going forward, we'll, we'll, we'll be speaking more. So thank you very much. Um, this formally ends the portion of our hearing uh, for our experts. And we'll take a short break now before we move into the public testimony portion of our hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, guys, we'll go ahead and get started back up again here. Uh, before we formally begin uh, tonight's public testimony, I've invited uh, Macy Her to say a few words. Uh, Macy? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you, and I'm uh, thank you for this time that I'm being given to say a few words. And I was waiting in the waiting room. I, um, something came to mind that I had not planned on saying, but I will start with. Um, that as far back as when the lands were primarily occupied by First Nations, one way to keep the First Nations people from practicing their cultures, beliefs, and values, and from allowing them to strategize ways to stay together, the settlers separated them. Separation of people, divide and conquer has long been a strategy used to separate the most vulnerable of populations and to obtain control. And so the strategy continues to be used until this day. I know that redistricting means different things to different people. When I think about redistricting and fair mapping, the first word that comes to my mind is representation. I, along with many others like me among American who came to the US with my parents from Laos have often wondered, am I represented in my district? When I was a child, I would feel what it's like to not be seen or heard, but not quite being able to understand why I felt that way. It would only be later in life as an adult and now as a professional would I better understand why I felt unseen and unheard at times. Why my parents and other Hmong individuals felt that same way and yet didn't think there was anything they could do to change their experiences. That is until some Hmong individuals whom I have the honor of calling big brothers and sisters stood up and said, we need to have seats at the table too. And these, this means we need to run for elected positions. So they did. At first, even those within the Hmong community doubted their Hmong brothers and sisters could win, especially with such unfairness in the world. But then these Hmong individuals proved their naysayers wrong. They won. They began to represent myself and those of my experiences growing up. We started to see and understand the power of the voice. But not only did we begin to see the power of the voice, those who disagreed with these newer change policies also saw the power in our voices at the table. Out of this came actions such as gerrymandering, redrawing district lines to ensure that some who are economically better off or look a particular way have certain advantages over others, have the same political views, could live together. More specifically, some schools receive more funding than others. The privileged often only become more privileged and the historically disadvantaged become even more disadvantaged, falling farther and farther behind in society. Let me just give you a few examples. Growing up in Wisconsin, I worked with campaigns for some Hmong individuals, which gave me a glimpse into how districting works. When elections were around the corner, there were some Hmong and other folks of color who wanted to run for office. But looking around in their districts, they knew they had nearly no chance to win based on how does district boundaries were drawn. Unfortunately, many Hmong individuals don't realize just how districting works. All they know is that their voices don't matter, or at least that's how they felt or feel. Only if they knew that if those district lines were redrawn just a little bit and that they could be, it could give power to voices like theirs simply because the new boundaries allow there to be more voices like theirs, those who can relate their, to their experiences and can sympathize enough to help make their voices matter. I'm not here to ask for our whole leg up in votes for these individuals. I'm just asking for a fairer, more equitable chance for all individuals in a community to have their voices matter, to have their votes, have their votes matter. Fair, equitable mapping to me means thoughtful consideration of all community members and how they can get their voices heard about any topic of concern they wish to address, knowing that it will be heard. My husband and I are currently house hunting. Now more than ever, we're keenly aware that where we choose to live will determine how powerful our vote in future elections will be. It will determine how, um, the types of resources my child will receive in school because of those who are making decisions on a local and perhaps even the state level. In general, how boundaries are drawn will determine how far some children have to travel to get to school. 
There are still too many Hmong families and other historically disadvantaged families in this state. Many who are lower income and have parents or guardians who work more than one job and just aren't able to transport their children to school on a daily basis. To attend a quote unquote good school or even just to, to the closest school could mean walking long distances, distances to get there or missing school due to poor weather or no transportation altogether. All things that could change with some redistricting. So what are the implications for Hmong communities across the state when it comes to redistricting? It has been knowing whether it has, it's knowing whether or not their votes matter. Knowing whether or not someone who looks like them has experiences like them has a chance at ever winning an election. It means whether or not their children get to go to school with a diverse group of students and can benefit too from resources that other students receive so that they too have an equitable chance at moving forward in society. It has meant and means having the equal possibility of voting for someone who at least shares their basic beliefs and values. A former colleague of mine once said, people shouldn't be made to have to get along. People are simply more comfortable with those who act and look like them. We shouldn't fault them for that. So does this mean that those in poverty should remain in areas of poverty? That certain races and ethnicities should be segregated because it makes them feel comfortable? I don't think so. Unless we create spaces, create districts where its communities have to listen to diverse representations because the lines have been drawn accordingly. Are we, are we ever going to grow as a society and to learn how to work with those different from ourselves? It is not good enough to say, well, people just like to live with certain kinds of people. It's just not good enough. It's not good enough to say people have a right to feel comfortable and how people in their districts vote during elections. So, so comfortable, they don't even have to vote if they didn't want to. Where's the fairness in all of this? Shouldn't we all have a right to live where we want to live without worrying about whether our voices could make a difference? Whether that be at the voting booth or in a school board meeting or in a classroom. Commissioners and participants who have joined us today, I ask that you consider fair mapping, redistricting in ways that allow all segments of our community, even the most vulnerable, a voice and overall opportunity to be represented. Thanks so much for listening to me. Thank you, Macy. We will now begin approximately one hour of public testimony. The individuals testifying tonight registered ahead of tonight's meeting. As a reminder to tonight's testifiers, this hearing is recorded and being live streamed. Each individual will have three minutes to testify to the commission. I will notify individuals when three minutes is completed. To ensure the maximum amount of the public can address the commission members, the commission members will not be answering any questions or providing any comments following individual's testimony. This is a similar practice that legislative committees such as the Joint Finance Committee follows. Finally, as a reminder, if any members of the public would like to provide feedback or comments to the commission at any point throughout the tenure of the People's Maps Commission, you are encouraged to submit written comments to the public comment form that is available on wisconsin.gov slash people's maps. I will now hand it over to Matt Petering for our first uh, public testimony this evening. He is from the 4th Congressional District. Matt? Thank you. Greetings, commissioners. Happy New Year to you all. I'm a 30-year resident of Wisconsin's 4th Congressional District, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you this evening. Many of us are here because we want fair maps, but what exactly is a fair map? and how can one be created? Here are my thoughts on this matter. The first step in making a fair map is to collect geographic, demographic, and political data. In particular, we need to know the exact shape and location of each of Wisconsin's 7,000 voting wards. We need to know the total population, African-American population, and Hispanic population of each ward. And we need to know the total number of votes that were cast in each ward for the Democratic and Republican presidential or gubernatorial candidate in each of the last four statewide elections. We then use these 7,000 voting wards as building blocks to create election districts. And we create two maps, one for the 33 state Senate districts and one for the 99 state assembly districts. In each map, the district populations are nearly equal. Each district is a single connected unit and the districts look nice to the eye. In addition, three assembly districts are nested within each Senate district 
and the voting interests of African American and Hispanic voters protected in accordance with the Voting Rights Act in both the state assembly and state senate map. That is, each map contains a certain number of districts in which the African American population exceeds a given percentage threshold and a certain number of districts in which the Hispanic population exceeds a given percentage threshold. The map should be fair in two respects. First, in both the Senate and the Assembly map, the percentage of districts to be won by each party should be as close as possible to the percentage of the statewide vote received by the party in recent elections. In Wisconsin's last four statewide elections, Republican votes for governor and president have outnumbered Democratic votes by a 50 to 49 ratio on average. A fair assembly map should therefore give Republicans 50 expected victories and Democrats 49 expected victories. And a fair Senate map should give Republicans 17 expected victories and Democrats 16 expected victories. Assuming the historical vote from 2014 to 2020 in each ward continues exactly into the future. To be fair, each map should also exhibit partisan symmetry. That is, each party should have the same number of vulnerable districts that are expected to be won by a narrow margin in each map. Finally, the number of competitive districts in which the expected victory margin is 10% or less should be maximized. Creating fair Senate and Assembly districts is not a trivial undertaking. However, it is possible. In fact, I've developed a computer program that can do it automatically. Every time I run the program, I get a different pair of fair maps that satisfy all previously mentioned criteria. Behind me is one such pair of fair maps I created. On the left is the Senate map, and on the right is the matching assembly map. In each map, each voting ward is colored according to the district it belongs to. So far, I've made 12 maps like this, but I could produce 1,200 if needed. The message is clear. A fair map is not some mythical goal. It's something tangible that you're looking at right now. Please Thank let you, me know if I may be of service in the effort to create fair maps. Thank you for helping to revitalize Wisconsin's democracy. Thank you. Have a good evening. The next individual testifying is Kevin McCourt from the 4th Congressional District. Kevin? Hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm actually from the 5th District. Uh, I think a little typo maybe on my part there. Um, so I've been in the 5th District about seven years, uh, Wisconsin about 15. Um, so I want to start just by saying thank you to, to those on the, the commission here. I think this is a, a, a great undertaking. I appreciate all of you spending your time on this. So I'm sure it's a lot of time that we're not seeing. Um, I think the speakers have been great. I've been following along um, since the beginning. I think the feedback from the public's been great. Um, clearly, as the previous speaker mentioned, we're all here because we're, we're passionate about fairness. Um, so I want to address a little bit more on uh, tactically two, two items around the how. Um, the first is around transparency. Um, I, I think publishing the criteria and process, I, I'm sure you guys are having many, many conversations, but I think the sooner you can share kind of what you're thinking, how you're thinking, I think that helps the public, you know, the sooner you can provide it, the, the more uh, we can provide valuable feedback back on if we're agreeing, disagreeing. Um, I'm sure you're going to share the maps when we get closer to that. Um, but I think that's going to be really, really key. There, there's a lot of organizations um, out there. I, I tend to, I belong to uh, represent us. And there's a lot of organizations like that that are watching this and want to help persuade our legislators, but we need that transparency. So that's my ask is the sooner you can, you can share, even if it's pieces, kind of what you're thinking, where you're going. Um, I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, and my second point is around the use of political data. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of conversation about states and what different states models are. Um, I, I think I, I tend to be of the belief that I think we should look at our neighbor, um, the Iowa model. They have ample information. They've been using it for decades. Definitely nonpartisan. Um, I tend to not agree with using voter data. I, I don't know how we can create a, a nonpartisan map using partisan data. Um, so, and, and I also don't think our founders, you know, said let's do this every ten years based because we need to readjust on how people are voting. I think it's more about population. Um, so that's just my, my view of it. Um, I look forward to supporting your work and, and seeing what uh, some of the items you guys produce. Um, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Kevin. Have a good evening. Thanks. The next individual testifying this evening is Angela Lang from the 4th Congressional District. Angela? Good evening. I want to thank the commission for taking the time to gather input from various members of the community about the important redistricting process. My name is Angela Lang and I am privileged to serve as the executive director of Block Black Leaders Organizing for Communities. 
I'm here today because a fair redistricting process goes hand in hand with Block's mission, which is to ensure a high quality of life and access to opportunities for members of the Black community in Milwaukee and throughout Wisconsin. Access to opportunity is the critical part. Without the access to democracy, we can't have a high quality of life. Having fair maps is a way to have access to a democratic system. The events of January 6th in our nation's capital show that democracy can be fragile and needs to be handled carefully. For years, communities of color have been fighting and scratching to have a, have a seat at the table that is democracy. Our communities not having fair representation directly impacts our quality of life. We see Wisconsin always a part of national discussions about redistricting and unfortunately not always in a good way. In fact, our maps are so bad that we just need to start over. We cannot draw new and fair maps off the existing unfair ones. When drafting maps, I strongly encourage the commission to not begin with baseline maps or drafting based off of core population. This moment in our history with current events forces us to dream about the democracy we want and one that includes everyone in a fair and just way. We cannot build just systems and institutions off the framework of ones that have failed us. It is critical that we have maps that are compliant with the Voting Rights Act. Maps that are not only compliant with the Voting Rights Act, but moreover recommended by the People's Maps Commission to utilize a model ranked set of criteria when beginning to draft the People's Maps. Voter suppression and gerrymandering are two sides of the same coin. If maps continue to be gerrymandered, then it is yet another barrier of access to communities of color. If we want a healthy, robust democracy, then the people need to have faith in its process and that the maps are fair and that there are avenues for everyone to be heard. The maps need to be drawn with the interests of the people at the forefront, especially the most mar marginalized, including the communities that I represent and I organize every day. Our communities are struggling. We call, we send letters, we request meetings, and the will of the people often isn't listened to, let alone upheld. We always talk about how we need everyone to participate in our democracy, but the current setup and maps don't allow for that. When drafting the people's maps, we need to make sure that we center the most marginalized. In closing, our democracy is wounded. It's been for a long time, honestly, and you all can play a small role in making sure that people have access to democracy to have their voices heard and ultimately keeping Wisconsin moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, have a good evening. The next individual we have testifying is Michael Gilvery from the 4th Congressional District. Michael? Hello, this is Michael Gilvery. I am, uh, I've lived in Milwaukee for 26 years now, mostly in the 53207 um, zip code, which is uh, southeast corner of the town near, near uh, St. Francis. Uh, for all those years, plus a few more, Prior to moving to Wisconsin, I have worked in the federal uh, civil service. This means that by law, I have not been involved in partisan politics beyond voting in over 30 years. My opinion is strictly my own and independent of my employer or the interests of any political party. Uh, even further background, back in the 80s, I, I was living in Indiana, which at the time had the most gerrymandered uh, map in the country. Now I'm this past decade, I've been in Wisconsin, so I witnessed uh, up close the effects of the failure of politicians to resist the temptation of letting their personal career self-interest interfere with the duty to draw impartial maps. There are multiple criteria which this commission could use to, besides the principle of general equality of population and the Voting Rights Act uh, requirements that were discussed uh, earlier this evening. Uh, other valid criteria include the impact, the uh, compactness of the district, uh, recognition of existing local government boundaries, and the competitiveness. Uh, compactness has many different measures, but the general goal is to minimize the distance between the potential uh, representative and their constituents. Geographically small districts make it naturally easier for voters to be well, well represented by their neighbors who may, may encounter some of the same uh, issues that, that they do na na on a national basis. And the competitiveness of a district is a critical check on a potential problem of unresponsive representatives. If the incumbent knows that their job is secure, they need not be concerned about the, the issues facing their constituents. 
Likewise, in order to have a legislature as a whole, which reflects the contemporary uh, views of, of the state, we need districts that, to be generally competitive so that uh, as, as issues come up, the, the views of the, the voters matches the, the uh, legislation that is passed. Uh, I remember back uh, from my Indiana days that in the 80s that multiple political experts defined a competitive legislative district to be one where the, the local minority party, whether it be the Democrat or the Republican party, tended to get at least 45% in, in a low profile race. Like for, for example, at the time was um, the, the superintendent of, of state schools that, that you know, not, not a whole high profile race with a lot of ads. So people tended to vote mostly by, by their party line. Thank you, Michael. You thank you, Michael. Okay. Thank you. That, your three minutes is up. Thank you. Okay. The next individual we have testifying this evening is Laura Vukovich. I apologize, I, I probably butchered your last name. From the fourth congressional district. No worries, everyone butchers my name, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, my name is Laura Wichitich um, and I live in Fox Point. I've been a volunteer with the Fair Elections Project for three years, more than three years. And I am very passionate about bringing fairness back to the map drawing process. Um, democracy is broken in Wisconsin, we all know that. And I'm not gonna tell you why or how you know all that already, um, I've actually watched all of these um, commission meetings so far, so I'm not going to waste your time with stuff you've already heard. What I want to do with my three minutes tonight, actually, is to make sure that you think about more than just the map drawing itself. Um, because it doesn't matter, actually, how good or fair the map is that you create. Um, it doesn't matter how fair and open your process is. It doesn't matter how above reproach the commission is. The unfortunate truth is, is that the maps will be mocked and dismissed by our legislature. The commission will draw a good map. Actually, I have really good confidence in that. You guys are doing excellent work. You're getting excellent experts and you're asking excellent questions. You seem very earnest. So I know you'll draw a good map, um, but the legislature will dismiss it out of hand and draw their own. And then the governor will veto that one. And so it will end up in the courts where it may or may not, your map may or may not be used. All of this is a foregone conclusion. So it's important to remember that this commission is just one part of a broader long-term strategy to get our legislature to finally do the right thing. You guys have been tasked by the governor to draw a fair map, but it's not just the map. Since citizens like myself can't do anything to force the legislature to draw maps fairly this year and we know that they're going to reject the one that you guys draw the only thing left is to make sure that they know that the public is watching i don't actually know how you guys should do it but you need somehow to publicize what you're doing better i'm super tuned into this issue and yet i only heard about this meeting by randomly scrolling on twitter in all of your meetings so far not one public comment has come from someone who doesn't support you I know Wisconsinites are super in favor of fair maps, but couldn't it also be because the skeptics just don't know you exist? If the other side has no information about what you're doing, the folks that support the status quo will fill the void with messaging and then they'll control the narrative and you can't let them control the narrative. So that means you've got to think about this from a PR perspective as well. Get on local radio shows, write op-eds in local papers, join local Facebook forums and tout your work, get out ahead of the narrative because otherwise all this great work that you guys are doing will be for naught. So thanks very much for listening to me and thank you very, very much for your good work. Perfect, thank you so much. The next individual we have um, testifying this evening is Representative Deb Endraka from the 4th Congressional District. Representative? Hi everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and for all the really hard work that you're doing. 
No one knows the impact of gerrymandering quite like someone who's run for office in a gerrymandered district, and that's me. Uh, I am Deb Andraka. I live in the 4th Congressional District in Whitefish Bay, and I'm the newly elected state representative for the 23rd Assembly District, which includes Whitefish Bay, Fox Point, Bayside, the eastern part of Mequon, gerrymandering, Fiendsville, and Grafton. And I ran for office because for more than a decade, my state representative didn't listen to me. And because of gerrymandering, he didn't have to. As a constituent, I would call his office, send emails, request meetings, and mostly I was ignored. And I soon realized that most of my neighbors also felt the same. Over and over again, I heard during the campaign that people were fed up with the partisanship and gridlock in Madison. And they elected me because they wanted a change and they want someone who's willing to work hard and reach across political lines. And that's what I intend to do. Unfortunately, in just two weeks on the job, I'm already feeling the weight of the task at hand. I always believe that once elected, representatives should try to put politics aside and do the people's business. And just a few weeks ago, I was in a new legislator training session and I asked two seasoned lawmakers from the opposite party, what was their advice for working across the aisle? And I was expecting to hear something like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all working to make our state better or get to know each other, find common interests. Their response was, good luck. You flipped a district and you have a target on your back. None of us want you to succeed at anything and we're coming for your seat. This is what happens when you gerrymander. Your party becomes more important than your policies. Redistricting shouldn't be about Republican maps or Democratic maps. It's about restoring competitiveness to our elections and accountability to our elected office. I'm an elementary school teacher. And when my students are out at recess and someone's not playing fair, they know it. And voters know when, vo when, poli voters know when politicians aren't playing fair too. It's time to let people draw the maps, not elected officials. And I say this as an elected official. And the best way to make this happen is for all of you, the People's Map Commission, to provide us with an example of a fair, well-designed map to show us the way. Thank you all for your hard work and I really look forward to working with you. Great. Thank you so much, have a good evening. The next individual we have is Ann Royer from the 5th Congressional District, Ann. Hi, my name is Ann Rohr, and I live in the city of Wauwatosa in the 5th Congressional District, and I want to thank you all for this opportunity and for all the work that you're doing. I worked in healthcare for 35 years, and as a nurse practitioner, I became aware of the negative policy impacts of our gerrymandered legislative maps, especially during the 2017 fight to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I had volunteered for years at a free clinic in West Dallas, specifically serving the working uninsured. So I saw firsthand the detrimental effects of inadequate health care on people's lives, families, and livelihoods. I provided care to our mechanics, our daycare providers, waiters, housekeepers, and salon workers. These are all hardworking individuals without employer-sponsored health insurance. We could only provide basic uh, donated medications as a Band-Aid fix for people's serious chronic health conditions. The Affordable Care Act helped many of these individuals finally receive the consistent care they needed and the clinic has subsequently closed. I began attending town hall meetings held by my state representative and senator and my congressman in 2017 and I shared my firsthand experiences of the positive impacts of the Affordable Care Act on patients' lives. To my naive surprise, my comments and suggestions fell on deaf ears. Although the majority of Wisconsin residents support the Affordable Care Act, Wisconsin legislators have repeatedly blocked measures to strengthen coverage through Medicare expansion and the acceptance of federal aid. In fact, my congressman voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act in 2017. Thankfully, the repeal vote did not pass. Now fast forward to May of 2020. My youngest daughter, 17 years old at the time, uh, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, also called juvenile diabetes. Um, this is an autoimmune disorder with no cure. She cannot survive without multiple daily injections of insulin. And this is now her pre-existing condition for the rest of her life. Currently, of course, she has the privilege of being on my employer health insurance. 
However, that will not be the case as she moves into adulthood. Her future choices and opportunities will now be dictated by this pre-existing condition um, and the affordability of her insulin and related treatments that are required. She would die in five to seven days without insulin, that's a fact. Um, her life-sustaining treatments should not be dependent on privilege, luck, or the corporate money influencing our politicians. Healthcare should be a right for every individual and every American. I ask the members of the People's Maps Commission to really consider drawing legislative maps that result in elected representatives being uh, accountable to their constituents. We the people deserve a voice in our decisions or in their decisions and legislation that affects each of us, our Thanks, family, Anne. our communities and our lives. Thank you. Thank you, have a good night. Thanks. The next individual we have is Melanie Scherer from the second congressional district, Melanie. Good evening, thank you. Um, as a physician, um, I can make a more accurate uh, prediction about the lifespan and future health of a patient by looking at their zip code rather than their genetic code. Um, unless we make conscious efforts to change the way we look at power and privilege in our communities, these entrenched inequalities will persist and in fact widen further. I encourage the committee to utilize the research made available in the Neighborhood Atlas website and the Area Deprivation Index, which has been um, studied and produced by the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a colleague of mine, Dr. Amy Kind. The website and the Area Deprivation Index uh, is a metric that showcases um, the the measures of neighborhood disadvantages and it makes it freely available to the public. Um, these are available to help with the research, program planning and policy develop, uh, development. I encourage the committee members uh, to prioritize and maximize representation for those living in the most disadvantaged areas. To turn the tide towards justice, fairness is not just about giving everyone an equal voice, but about lifting up those voices that have been silenced for so long. My work as a community psychiatrist in rural Wisconsin uh, has placed me in the midst of those who are often overlooked uh, and unheard. And I ask on behalf of my patients that you consider uh, looking at these, uh, this area deprivation index and the neighborhood atlas as you consider drawing the map to uh, enhance the, the quality and quantity of the lives of uh, the patients in my community. Thanks. Thank you so much. The next individual we have is Carol Walcott from the 5th Congressional District. Carol? Oh, I think you're still muted. There. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Am I okay? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you to um, the committee. And I'd just like to say I, I amen um, all that's been said ahead of me. This is a really important issue. We live in a time of very deep divide, a time when the citizens of this country no longer believe in the government or their vote no longer counts. A time when misguided citizens take over the Capitol believing they are true patriots. We have many pressing issues that contribute to this problem, among them big money and government, um, fake news, highly biased news, coverage on both sides, and income equality. As a country, both Democrats and Republicans have much to do to defend our democracy and unite them. One of the most pressing issues is the assurance that all citizens, both Democrats and Republicans, have their voice heard and that their voice counts. Under our current system, this is not possible for the Democrats or even all of the Republicans who reside in ultra blue districts in the great state of Wisconsin. Before 2011, um, maps were drawn and the Republicans had about a two to three point advantage in controlling Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Assembly. They used this advantage, advantage to redistrict Wisconsin. So now they have a nine to 10 point advantage in controlling the assembly. This creates a body of legislatures that no longer answer to the needs of all citizens of Wisconsin, has any need to compromise or to listen to anyone outside their constituents. 
This shuts down the marketplace of ideas, a place of, comp uh, a place of competing solutions that come together to serve the needs of all people, not just the interest of one party. Um, 55 counties in Wisconsin represent 83% of the citizens of Wisconsin. They've passed refer referendums for demanding fair districts. As a Democrat, I know that my party doesn't have all of the answers. I would like to return to the days of competition between parties. And out of that will come competitions of ideas that lead to the best solutions. We know that we have the current technology that can create fair maps. It is time for the legislature to represent all of its citizens. Having a voice in your government is the basis of democracy. It's the right thing to do. And without it, we are fooling ourselves because without it, there is no democracy. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Carol. The next individual is William Chandler from the 1st Congressional District. William? Thank you. Um, I am Bill Chandler from Whitewater. I'm speaking on behalf of the Walworth County Democrats and the Whitewater Democrats, both large active organizations. When Tony Evers was elected, Democrats captured all the statewide offices. The popular vote also went to Democrats. However, more offices went to Republicans and Democrats due to gerrymandering. This is not democracy. Voters choose politicians, not the other way around. At the local level here in Whitewater, our representation is diluted because we are mixed in with the Western Waukesha County, the richest area of Wisconsin. Whitewater is also split between the fifth CD and the first CD. For example, tonight my name is listed as Whitewater in the first CD. When I live in the part of Whitewater that is the fifth CD. This is confusing to our local citizens, which leads to voter disenfranchisement. An area that shares common interests should not be split. The Wallace County Democrats and the Whitewater Democrats support Tony Evers' plan to form a group of six citizens, three on each side, to each draw electoral maps and submit them to a three-person Wisconsin federal court, not the, Racine, not the Wisconsin Supreme Court, as a final arbiter. Wisconsin voters deserve fair maps. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. The next individual is Carol Terrell from the second congressional district. Carol? Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Terrell. I live in the second congressional district, but I have a concern about Milwaukee that I wanted to address tonight. The current state legislative and congressional district maps have put my friends here at a disadvantage that threatens their children's health. During the year of clean drinking water declared by for 2019 by Governor Evers, I was very pleased that the Speaker of the Assembly appointed a special task force to explore statewide water quality issues and to propose legislative and state budget recommendations. They spent most of a year on this. Exposure to lead is one of the issues they learned about at public input meetings they held. Doctors, nurses, and public health officials testified that there is no safe level for lead in drinking water that infants and young school children consume. <clears throat> Elevated lead levels of, uh, in children's blood are toxic even in low doses, especially in young children and infants. Lead affects the development of their brains and nervous systems. A loss of developmental skills in young children will impair their futures. Um, parents testified that the damage to young children's health has continued for years without their knowledge. When water testing is finally done, many schools and daycare centers switch to bottled water, but the damage had already been done. Testimony like this occurred from Milwaukee residents, but also in La Crosse, Racine, and elsewhere around the state. So what happened? Nothing from the legislature, although the DNR responded with some help. So why did nothing happen? 
legislators in the majority decided they could ignore the testimony. They could ignore the pleas from families to protect their young children in schools and daycare centers. They could safely do nothing because their seats were safe. We all know that we live in a purple state, almost evenly divided between Republican voters and Democratic voters. Just look at the November 3rd election. If every election were statewide, our congressional delegation would be half Dems and half Republicans. Instead, we have three Democrats and five Republican members of the US House of Representatives. We realize that the congressional districts were drawn to ensure that the people elected in Congressional District 2 and Congressional District 4 are Democratic. And the rest of the state, CD 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, will be Republican. And that only CD 3 would be truly competitive. In the situation of gerrymandered, non-competitive districts, we have lost the power of accountability by voters. Gerrymandering has crippled choice for the voters because candidate recruitment to challenge an incumbent is very difficult given the odds. Those who are elected in these gerrymandered districts do not feel accountable to the voters in the districts. As a result, they are not accountable to their fellow elected leaders and voters in any districts in the state. They can ignore anyone. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. And just a reminder, um, for those of you um, that ran a little over, if you've written testimony, we encourage you to submit it to the wisconsin.gov slash people's maps form so that we can see um, your entirety of your testimony. Thank you. The next individual we have testifying is Sam Liebert from the 5th Congressional District. Sam? Hi, good evening, um, honorable members of the People's Maps Commission. Uh, thank you for your time and for your public service and for holding these crucial public hearings about an important issue. Uh, my name is Sam, Sam Leibert. Um, I live in the village of Pewaukee in Waukesha County. Um, I was unable to make the, the fifth congressional district hearing, I think back in October. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I just wanted to vocalize my support for fair maps in Wisconsin. Um, I like to think that the old saying, when we all do better, we all do better, still um, is a poignant saying. Um, and that's what Fair Maps for Wisconsin can do in the upcoming redistrict redistricting process. Um, yes, redistricting is required, uh, but sidelining democracy is not required. Uh, from a young age, we're taught that um, one person is one vote. Uh, in many cases, though, depending on your zip code in Wisconsin, your vote doesn't really count. It's already predetermined, it's predestined who your state representative is going to be, um, which party your state senator will be, um, and probably who your congressman or congresswoman will be. Why even bother to vote? Right now in Wisconsin, we have politicians choosing their voters, not voters choosing their politicians. I strongly believe uh, that we should be following our neighbor, uh, neighboring state, Iowa. We should be having nonpartisan legislative staff, uh, which are overseen by retired nonpartisan judges uh, drawing and administering our map process. Districts should be contiguous. Um, they should make sense geographically and um, and we should use natural borders for drawing our maps, um, not packing and cracking voters into districts. This process, by the way, um, that we're currently doing, um, I believe is racist and, and regressive in many ways. Um, we should be allowed to have fair and balanced districts. Uh, every two years we vote for our assembly members, um, half of the Senate and uh, all eight members of Congress. And they're supposed to be reflective of the current mood and the will of the people. Mark Twain once quipped that politicians are a lot like diapers. They should be changed on a regular basis for reasons. So please allow our citizens um, to uh, have their votes matter once again in Wisconsin. And um, I just wanna say again, I, I, I support fair maps. Um, I believe that, uh, there's a model for it to be done. And I thank you for your time and for listening to me. Perfect, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Our final individual testifying this evening is Daniel Wentland from the second congressional district. Daniel? Nope, I think you just accidentally remuted yourself. Okay. There you go. Um, okay, thank you. I'm Dan Wentland. I live in Windsor, Wisconsin. 
north of Madison. I'm not affiliated with any political group or affiliation. The redistricting issue is a Republican and Democrat issue that needs to be fixed. Most people say that the redistricting will be solved by a bipartisan solution, but that will not fix the root cause, that of humans drawing the districts. As humans, we are all affected by outside forces, good and bad. Added to that, if we fix one district, we affect another. So enough of the humans. I came up with a plan to use census data blocks, the same data source that is used to verify populations in current districts, and a computer process to form the districts. With this approach, nestings of districts can be accomplished. So using the 2010 census data, each federal district would be made up of roughly 4.25 Senate districts, and each Senate, state Senate district would be made up of each of three representative districts. An additional benefit is that at the next sentence, census, districts will change some, but there will not be this massive change we see now. By making districts based only on population, we would be able to elect people that will represent all of the district's residents. Nesting will help residents get their views heard and acted upon, not just the party views. We now focus on parties in forming districts when we should be more focused on the people of the district. For the most part, residents in an area get along with another resident, their neighbors, and it's not like the current political structures. So the plan would work like this. The state is broken into lanes going east to west and west to east using current county boundaries. The census data blocks are ordered by longitude and latitude and population is accumulated. When the running total comes to the average size of a district, a district is formed. Each census data block is labeled with the three different distinct district types. Yes, some districts are larger and some smaller, but the average district is in the acceptable range. The only question to include is, is to include a census block or to pass it on to the next district. Yeah, I did this with the, the, state, the state using the 2010 census data, and it completely looks different from maps of the past, and it would be a lot fairer. So I asked the commission to have the Legislative Reference Bureau try it with the 2010 data and then do the 2020 data. This would be a great way to start the process and maybe move forward. When redistricting winds up in the courts, this, path, this approach would pass the test of fairness. It treats all the residents the same in the great state of Wisconsin. I'd like to thank you for your time. If you have any info, you can find me. And again, thank you for the time. Good night. Perfect, thank you, sir. Have a good evening. And thank you to the members of the public who testified this evening and watched online. Chair Ford, I will now pass it back to you to close out the hearing and adjourn. Thanks, Molly. Thank you to all our expert speakers, commissioners, and members of the public for speaking uh, and providing testimony for us tonight. Uh, commissioners, we have a lot to consider and uh, look forward to um, hearing and discussing uh, with you guys in the future. Uh, as a reminder, the commission will hold another virtual public hearing uh, January 28th in the 7th Congressional District. Registration to testify for the January 28th hearing will open soon. Uh, however, individuals can submit written comments to the commission at any point using the public input form, uh, wisconsin.gov front slash people's maps. This evening's hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.